This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Chapter 3 Reading. With a little more deliberation, in the choice of their pursuits, all men would perhaps become essentially students and observers. For certainly their nature and destiny are interesting to all alike. In accumulating property for ourselves or our posterity, in founding a family or a state, or acquiring fame even, we are mortal. But in dealing with truth, we are immortal and need fear no change nor accident. The oldest Egyptian or Hindu philosopher raised a corner of the veil from the statue of the divinity, and still the trembling robe remains raised, and I gaze upon as fresh a glory as he did, since it was I in him that was then so bold, and it is he in me that now reviews the vision. No dust has settled on that robe, no time has elapsed since that divinity was revealed. That time which we really improve, or which is improvable, is neither past, present, nor future. My residence was more favorable not only to thought, but to serious reading, than a university, and though I was beyond the range of the ordinary circulating library, I had more than ever come within the influence of those books which circulate round the world, whose sentences were first written on bark, and are now merely copied from time to time onto linen paper. Says the poet Mr. Udd, Being seated, to run through the region of the spiritual world, I have had this advantage in books. To be intoxicated by a single glass of wine, I have experienced this pleasure when I have drunk the liquor of the esoteric doctrines. I kept Homer's Iliad on my table through the summer, though I looked at his page only now and then. Incessant labor with my hands, at first, for I had my house to finish and my beans to hoe at the same time, made more study impossible. Yet I sustained myself by the prospect of such reading in future. I read one or two shallow books of travel in the intervals of my work till that employment made me ashamed of myself, and I asked where it was then that I lived. The student may read Homer or Aeschylus in the Greek without danger of dissipation or luxuriousness, for it implies that he in some measure emulate their heroes, and consecrate morning hours to their pages. The heroic books even if printed in the character of our mother tongue, will always be in a language dead to degenerate times. And we must laboriously seek the meaning of each word and line, conjecturing a larger sense than common use permits out of what wisdom and valor and generosity we have. The modern, cheap, and fertile press, with all its translations, has done little to bring us nearer to the heroic writers of antiquity. They seem as solitary, and the letter in which they are printed as rare and curious as ever. It is worth the expense of youthful days and costly hours, if you learn only some words of an ancient language, 
which are raised out of the trivialness of the street to be perpetual suggestions and provocations. It is not in vain that the farmer remembers and repeats the few Latin words which he has heard. Men sometimes speak as if the study of the classics would at length make way for more modern and practical studies. But the adventurous student will always study classics, in whatever language they may be written and however ancient they may be. For what are the classics but the noblest recorded thoughts of man? They are the only oracles which are not decayed, and there are such answers to the most modern inquiry in them as Delphi and Dodona never gave. We might as well omit to study nature because she is old. To read well, that is to read true books in a true spirit, is a noble exercise, and one that will task the reader more than any exercise which the customs of the day esteem. It requires a training such as the athletes underwent, the steady intention almost of the whole life to this object. Books must be read as deliberately and reservedly as they were written. It is not enough to be able to speak the language of that nation by which they are written, for there is a memorable interval between the spoken and the written language, the language heard and the language read. The one is commonly transitory, a sound, a tongue, a dialect, merely, almost brutish, and we learn it unconsciously, like the brutes of our mothers. The other is the maturity and experience of that if that is our mother-tongue. This is our father-tongue, a reserved and select expression, too significant to be heard by the ear, which we must be born again in order to speak. The crowds of men who merely spoke the Greek and Latin tongues in the Middle Ages were not entitled by the accident of birth to read the works of genius written in those languages, for these were not written in that Greek or Latin which they knew, but in the select language of literature. They had not learned the nobler dialects of Greece and Rome, but the very materials on which they were written were waste paper to them, and they prized instead a cheap contemporary literature. But when the several nations of Europe had acquired distinct, though rude, written languages of their own, sufficient for the purposes of their rising literatures, then first learning revived, and scholars were enabled to discern from that remoteness the treasures of antiquity what the Roman and Grecian multitude could not hear, after the lapse of ages, a few scholars read, and a few scholars only are still reading it. However much we may admire the orator's occasional bursts of eloquence, the noblest written words are commonly as far behind or above the fleeting spoken language as the firmament with its stars is behind the clouds. There are the stars, and they who can may read them. The astronomers forever comment on and observe them. They are not exhalations like our daily colloquies and vaporous breath. What is called eloquence in the forum is commonly found to be rhetoric in the study. The orator 
yields to the inspiration of a transient occasion and speaks to the mob before him to those who can hear him but the writer whose more equable life is his occasion and who would be distracted by the event in the crowd of which inspire the orator speaks to the intellect and health of mankind to all in any age who can understand him no wonder that alexander carried the iliad with him on his expeditions in a precious casket a written word is the choicest of relics it is something at once more intimate with us and more universal than any other work of art it is the work of art nearest to life itself it may be translated into every language and not only be read but actually breathed from all human lips not be represented on canvas or in marble only but be carved out of the breath of life itself the symbol of an ancient man's thought becomes a modern man's speech two thousand summers have imparted to the monuments of grecian literature as to her marbles only a maturer golden and autumnal tint for they have carried their own serene and celestial atmosphere into all lands to protect them against the corrosion of time books are the treasured wealth of the world and the fit inheritance of generations and nations books the oldest and the best stand naturally and rightfully on the shelves of every cottage they have no cause of their own to plead but while they enlighten and sustain the reader his common sense will not refuse them their authors are a natural and irresistible aristocracy in every society and more than kings or emperors exert an influence on mankind when the illiterate and perhaps scornful trader has earned by enterprise and industry his coveted leisure and independence and is admitted to the circles of wealth and fashion he turns inevitably at last to those still higher but yet inaccessible circles of intellect and genius and is sensible only of the imperfection of his culture and the vanity and insufficiency of all his riches and further proves his good sense by the pains which be taken to secure for his children that intellectual culture whose want he so keenly feels and thus it is that he becomes the founder of a family those who have not learned to read the ancient classics in the language in which they were written must have a very imperfect knowledge of the history of the human race for it is remarkable that no transcript of them has ever been made into any modern tongue unless our civilization itself may be regarded as such a transcript homer has never yet been printed in english nor aeschylus nor virgil even works as refined as solidly done and as beautiful almost as the morning itself for later writers say what we will of their genius have rarely if ever equaled the elaborate beauty and finish and the life long and heroic literary labors of the ancients they only talk of 
forgetting them who never knew them. It will be soon enough to forget them when we have the learning and the genius which will enable us to attend to and appreciate them. That age will be rich indeed when those relics which we call classics and the still older and more than classic but even less known scriptures of the nations shall have still further accumulated, when the Vatican shall be filled with Vedas and Zendavestas and Bibles with Homers and Dantes and Shakespeare's, and all the centuries to come shall have successively deposited their trophies in the forum of the world. By such a pile we may hope to scale heaven at last. The works of the great poets have never yet been read by mankind, for only great poets can read them. They have only been read as the multitude read the stars, at most astrologically, not astronomically. Most men have learned to read to serve a paltry convenience, as they have learned to cipher in order to keep accounts and not be cheated in trade, but of reading as a noble intellectual exercise they know little or nothing. Yet this only is reading, in a high sense, not that which lulls us as a luxury and suffers the nobler faculties to sleep the while, but what we have to stand on tiptoe to read and devote our most alert and wakeful hours to. I think that having learned our letters we should read the best that is in literature, and not be forever repeating our A, B, A, Bs, and words of one syllable in the fourth or fifth classes sitting on the lowest and foremost form all our lives. Most men are satisfied if they read or hear read, and perchance have been convicted by the wisdom of one good book, the Bible and for the rest of their lives vegetate and dissipate their faculties in what is called easy reading. There is a work in several volumes in our circulating library entitled Little Reading, which I thought referred to a town of that name which I had not been to. There are those who, like cormorants and ostriches, can digest all sorts of this, even after the fullest dinner of meats and vegetables, for they suffer nothing to be wasted. If others are the machines to provide this provender, they are the machines to read it. They read the nine thousandth tale about Zebulon and Zophronia, and how they loved as none had ever loved before, and neither did the course of their true love run smooth. At any rate, how it did run and stumble, and get up again, and go on. How some poor unfortunate got up on to a steeple who had better never have gone up as far as the belfry, and then having needlessly got him up there, the happy novelist rings the bell for all the world to come together and hear— Oh, dear, how he did get down again. For my part, I think that they had better metamorphose all such aspiring heroes of universal noveldom into man-weathercocks, as they used to put heroes among the constellations, and let them swing round there till they are rusty, and not come down at all to bother honest men with their pranks. The next time the novelist rings the bell, I will not stir, though the meeting-house burn down. The skip of the tiptoe hop, 
a romance of the Middle Ages by the celebrated author of Tittle Tall Tan to appear in monthly parts. A great rush, don't all come together. All this they read with saucer eyes, and erect and primitive curiosity, and with unwearied gizzard, whose corrugations even yet need no sharpening, just as some little four-year-old bencher his two-cent gilt-covered edition of Cinderella, without any improvement that I can see in the pronunciation or accent or emphasis or any more skill in extracting or inserting the moral. The result is dullness of sight, a stagnation of the vital circulations, and a general deliquium and sloughing off of all the intellectual faculties. This sort of gingerbread is baked daily, and more sedulously than pure wheat or rye and Indian in almost every oven, and finds a surer market. The best books are not read even by those who are called good readers. What does our Concord culture amount to? There is in this town, with a very few exceptions, no taste for the best or for very good books, even in English literature, whose words all can read and spell. Even the college-bred and so-called liberally educated men here and everywhere have really little or no acquaintance with the English classics, and as for the recorded wisdom of mankind, the ancient classics and Bibles, which are accessible to all who will know of them, there are the feeblest efforts anywhere made to become acquainted with them. I know a woodchopper of middle age, who takes a French paper, not for news, as he says, for he is above that, but to keep himself in practice, he being a Canadian by birth, and when I ask him what he considers the best thing he can do in this world, he says, besides this, to keep up and add to his English. This is about as much as the college-bred generally do or aspire to do, and they take an English paper for the purpose. One who has just come from reading, perhaps one of the best English books, will find how many with whom he can converse about it. Or suppose he comes from reading a Greek or Latin classic in the original, whose praises are familiar even to the so-called illiterate, he will find nobody at all to speak to, but must keep silence about it. Indeed, there is hardly the professor in our colleges who, if he has mastered the difficulties of the language, has proportionally mastered the difficulties of the wit and poetry of a Greek poet, and has any sympathy to impart to the alert and heroic reader, and as for the sacred scriptures or Bibles of mankind, who in this town can tell me even their titles, most men do not know that any nation but the Hebrews have had a scripture. A man, any man, will go considerably out of his way to pick up a silver dollar. But here are golden words which the wisest men of antiquity have uttered, and whose words the wise of every succeeding age have assured us of. And yet we learn to read only as far as easy reading the primers and class books, and when we leave school, the little reading and story books, which are for boys and beginners, and our reading, our conversation and thinking, are all on a very low level, worthy only of 
pygmies and mannequins. I aspire to be acquainted with wiser men than this our Concord soil has produced, whose names are hardly known here. Or shall I hear the name of Plato and never read his book? As if Plato were my townsman, and I never saw him, my next neighbor, and I never heard him speak or attended to the wisdom of his words. But how actually is it? His dialogues, which contain what was immortal in him, lie on the next shelf, and yet I never read them. We are underbred and low-lived and illiterate, and in this respect I confess I do not make any very broad distinction between the illiterateness of my townsman who cannot read at all and the illiterateness of him who has learned to read only what is for children and feeble intellects. We should be as good as the worthies of antiquity, but partly by first knowing how good they were. We are a race of titmen, and soar but little higher in our intellectual flights than the columns of the daily paper. It is not all books that are as dull as their readers. There are probably words addressed to our condition exactly, which, if we could really hear and understand, would be more salutary than the morning or the spring to our lives, and possibly put a new aspect on the face of things for us. How many a man has dated a new era in his life from the reading of a book? The book exists for us perchance, which will explain our miracles and reveal new ones. The at present unutterable things we may find somewhere uttered. These same questions that disturb and puzzle and confound us have in their turn occurred to all the wise men. Not one has been omitted and each has answered them according to his ability, by his words and his life. Moreover, with wisdom we shall learn liberality. The solitary hired man on a farm in the outskirts of Concord, who has had his second birth and peculiar religious experience, and is driven, as he believes, into the silent gravity and exclusiveness by his faith, may think it is not true. But Zoroaster, thousands of years ago, traveled the same road and had the same experience. But he, being wise, knew it to be universal and treated his neighbors accordingly, and is even said to have invented and established worship among men. Let him humbly commune with Zoroaster, then, and through the liberalizing influence of all the worthies, with Jesus Christ himself, and let our church go by the board. We boast that we belong to the nineteenth century and are making the most rapid strides of any nation. But consider how little this village does for its own culture. I do not wish to flatter my townsmen, nor to be flattered by them, for that will not advance either of us. We need to be provoked goaded like oxen, as we are, into a trot. We have a comparatively decent system of common schools, schools for 
infants only, but excepting the half-starved lyceum in the winter, and laterally the puny beginning of a library suggested by the state, no school for ourselves. We spend more on almost any article of bodily aliment or ailment than our mental aliment. It is time that we had uncommon schools, that we did not leave off our education when we begin to be men and women. It is time that villages were universities, and their elderly inhabitants the fellows of universities, with leisure, if they are indeed so well off, to pursue liberal studies the rest of their lives. Shall the world be confined to one Paris or one Oxford for ever? Cannot students be boarded here and get a liberal education under the skies of Concord? Can we not hire some Abelard to lecture to us? Alas, what with foddering the cattle and tending the store, we are kept from school too long, and our education is sadly neglected. In this country, the village should in some respects take the place of the nobleman of Europe. It should be the patron of the fine arts. It is rich enough. It wants only the magnanimity and refinement. It can spend money enough on such things as farmers and traders value, but it is thought utopian to propose spending money for things which more intelligent men know to be of far more worth. This town has spent seventeen thousand dollars on a town house. Thank fortune or politics, but probably it will not spend so much on living wit, the true meat to put into that shell, in a hundred years. The one hundred and twenty-five dollars annually subscribed for a lyceum in the winter is better spent than any other equal sum raised in the town. If we live in the nineteenth century, why should we not enjoy the advantages which the nineteenth century offers? Why should our life be in any respect provincial? If we will read newspapers, why not skip the gossip of Boston and take the best newspaper in the world at once? not be sucking the pap of neutral family papers or browsing olive branches here in New England. Let the reports of all the learned societies come to us, and we will see if they know anything. Why should we leave it to Harper and Brothers and Redding and Company to select our reading. As the nobleman of cultivated taste surrounds himself with whatever conduces to his culture, genius, learning, wit, books, paintings, statuary, music, philosophical instruments, and the like, so let the village do not stop short at a pedagogue, a parson, a sexton, a, a parish library, and three select men, because our pilgrim forefathers got through a cold winter once on a bleak rock with these. To act collectively is according to the spirit of our institutions, and I am confident that, as our circumstances are more flourishing, our means are greater than the noblemen's. New England can hire all the wise men in the world 
to come and teach her, and board them round the while, and not be provincial at all. That is the uncommon school we want. Instead of noble men, let us have noble villages of men. If it is necessary, omit one bridge over the river, go round a little there, and throw one arch, at least, over the darker gulf of ignorance which surrounds us. End of chapter 3「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Chapter 4 Sounds But while we are confined to books, though the most select and classic, and read only particular written languages, which are themselves but dialects and provincial, we are in danger of forgetting the language which all things and events speak without metaphor, which alone is copious and standard. Much is published, but little printed. The rays which stream through the shutter will be no longer remembered when the shutter is wholly removed. No method nor discipline can supersede the necessity of being forever on the alert. What is a course of history or philosophy or poetry, no matter how well selected, or the best society, or the most admirable routine of life compared with the discipline of looking always at what is to be seen? Will you be a reader, a student merely, or a seer? Read your fate, see what is before you, and walk on into futurity. I did not read books the first summer. I hoed beans. Nay, I often did better than this. There were times when I could not afford to sacrifice the bloom of the present moment to any work, whether of the head or hands. I love a broad margin to my life. Sometimes, in a summer morning, having taken my accustomed bath, I sat in my sunny doorway from sunrise till noon, wrapped in a reverie amidst the pines and hickories and sumacs in undisturbed solitude and stillness, while the birds sing around or flitted noiseless through the house, until by the sun falling in at my west window, with the noise of some traveler's wagon on the distant highway, I was reminded of the lapse of time. I grew in those seasons, like corn in the night and they were far better than any work of the hands would have been. They were not time subtracted from my life, but so much over and above my usual allowance. I realized what the Orientals mean by contemplation and the forsaking of works. For the most part, I minded not how the hours went. The day advanced as if to light some work of mine. It was morning, and lo, now it is evening, and nothing memorable is accomplished. 
Instead of singing like the birds, I silently smiled at my incessant good fortune. As the sparrow had its trill sitting on the hickory before my door, so had I my chuckle or suppressed warble which he might hear out of my nest. My days were not days of the week, bearing the stamp of any heathen deity, nor were they minced into hours and fretted by the ticking of a clock. For I lived like the Puri Indians, of whom it is said that for yesterday, today, and tomorrow, they have only one word, and they express the variety of meaning by pointing backward for yesterday, forward for tomorrow, and overhead for the passing day. This was sheer idleness to my fellow townsmen, no doubt, but if the birds and flowers had tried me by their standard, I should not have been found wanting. A man must find his occasions in himself, it is true. The natural day is very calm, and will hardly reprove his indolence. I had this advantage at least in my mode of life, over those who were obliged to look abroad for amusement to society and the theatre, that my life itself was become my amusement, and never ceased to be novel. It was a drama of many scenes, and without an end. If we were always, indeed, getting our living, and regulating our lives according to the last and best mode we had learned, we should never be troubled with ennui. Follow your genius closely enough, and it will not fail to show you a fresh prospect every hour. Housework was a pleasant pastime. When my floor was dirty, I rose early, and, setting all of my furniture out of doors on the grass, bed and bedstead making but one budget, dashed water on the floor, and sprinkled white sand from the pond on it, and then with a broom scrubbed it clean and white. And by the time the villagers ha had broken their fast, the morning sun had dried my house sufficiently to allow me to move in again, and my meditations were almost uninterrupted. It was pleasant to see my whole household effects out on the grass, making a little pile like a gypsy's pack, and my three-legged table, from which I did not remove the books and pen and ink, standing amid the pines and hickory. They seemed glad to get out themselves, and as if unwilling to be brought in. I was sometimes tempted to stretch an awning over them and take my seat there. It was worth the while to see the sun shine on these things, and hear the free wind blow on them, so much more interesting most familiar objects look out of doors than in the house. A bird sits on the next bough, life everlasting grows under the table, and blackberry vines run round its legs, pine cones, chestnut burrs, and strawberry leaves are strewn about. It looks as if this was the way these forms came to be transferred to our furniture, to tables, chairs, and bedsteads, because they once stood in their midst. My house was on the side of a hill, immediately on the edge of the larger wood, in the midst of a young forest of pitch pines and hickories, and half a dozen rods from the pond, to which a narrow footpath led down the hill. In my front yard, 
grew the strawberry, blackberry, and life everlasting John's wart and goldenrod, shrub oaks and sand cherry, blueberry and ground nut. Near the end of May, the sand cherry, Cerasus pumilla, adorned the sides of the path with its delicate flowers arranged in umbels cylindrically about its short stems, which last in the fall, weighed down with good-sized and handsome cherries, fell over in wreaths like rays on every side. I tasted them out of compliment to nature, though they were scarcely palatable. The sumac, rus glabra, grew luxuriantly about the house, pushing up through the embankment which I had made, and growing five or six feet the first season. Its broad, pinnate, tropical leaf was pleasant, though strange to look on. The large buds, suddenly pushing out late in the spring from dry sticks which had seemed to be dead, developed themselves as by magic into graceful green and tender boughs, an inch in diameter, and sometimes, as I sat at my window, so heedlessly did they grow and tax their weak joints, I heard a fresh and tender bough suddenly fall like a fan to the ground, when there was not a breath of air stirring, broken off by its own weight. In August the large masses of berries which, when in flower, had attracted many wild bees, gradually assumed their bright velvety crimson hue, and by their weight again bent down and broke the tender limbs. As I sit at my window this summer afternoon, hawks are circling about my clearing. The tantivi of wild pigeons, flying by two and threes athwart my view, or perching restless on the white pine boughs behind my house, gives a voice to the air. A fish-hawk dimples the glassy surface of the pond and brings up a fish. A mink steals out of the marsh before my door and seizes a frog by the shore. The sedge is bending under the weight of the reed-birds flitting hither and thither, and for the last half-hour I have heard the rattle of railroad cars, now dying away and then reviving like the beat of a partridge, conveying travellers from Boston to the country. For I did not live so out of the world as that boy who, as I hear, was put out to a farmer in the east part of the town, but ere long ran away and came home again, quite down at the heel and homesick. He had never seen such a dull and out-of-the-way place. The folks were all gone off. Why, you couldn't even hear the whistle. I doubt if there is such a place in Massachusetts now. In truth, our village has become a butt for one of those fleet railroad shafts, and o'er our peaceful plain its soothing sound is concord. The Fitchburg Railroad touches the pond about a hundred rods south of where I dwell. I usually go to the village along its causeway, and am, as it were, related to society by this link. The men on the freight trains, who go over the whole length of the road, bow to me as to an old acquaintance. They pass me so often, and apparently they take me for an employee. And so I am. I, too, would fain be a track repairer somewhere in the orbit of the earth. The whistle of the locomotive penetrates my woods summer and winter, sounding like the scream of a hawk sailing over some farmer's yard, informing me that many restless city merchants are arriving within the circle of the town, or adventurous country traders from the other side. As they come under one horizon, 
they shout their warning to get off the track to the other, heard sometimes through the circles of two towns. Here come your groceries, country, your rations, countrymen. Nor is there any man so independent on his farm that he can say them nay. And here's your pay for them, screams the countryman's whistle. Timber like long battering rams going twenty miles an hour against the city's walls, and chairs enough to seat all the weary and heavy laden that dwell within them. With such huge and lumbering civility the country hands a chair to the city. All the Indian huckleberry hills are stripped, all the cranberry meadows are raked into the city. Up comes the cotton, down goes the woven cloth, up comes the silk, down goes the woolen, up comes the books, but down goes the wit that writes them. When I meet the engine with its train of cars moving off with planetary motion, or rather like a comet, for the beholder knows not if with that velocity and with that direction it will ever revisit this system, since its orbit does not look like a returning curve. With its steam cloud like a banner streaming behind it in golden and silver wreaths, like many a downy cloud which I have seen high in the heavens, unfolding its masses to the light, as if this traveling demigod, this cloud compeller, would ere long take the sunset sky for the livery of his train. When I hear the iron horse make the hills echo with his snort like thunder, shaking the earth with his feet and breathing fire and smoke from his nostrils, what kind of winged horse or fiery dragon they will put into the new mythology I don't know. It seems as if the earth had got a race now worthy to inhabit it. If all were as it seems, and men made the elements their servants for noble ends. If the cloud that hangs over the engine were the perspiration of heroic deeds, or as beneficent as that which floats over the farmer's fields, then the elements and nature herself would cheerfully accompany men on their errands and be their escort. I watch the passage of the morning cars with the same feeling that I do the rising of the sun, which is hardly more regular, their train of clouds stretching far behind and rising higher and higher, going to heaven while the cars are going to Boston, conceals the sun for a minute and casts my distant field into the shade, a celestial train beside which the petty train of cars which hugs the earth is but the barb of the spear. The stabler of the iron horse was up early this winter morning by the light of the stars amid the mountains to fodder and harness his steed. Fire, too, was awakened thus early to put the vital heat in him and get him off, if the enterprise were as innocent as it is early. If the snow lies deep, they strap on him snowshoes, and, with the giant plow, plow a furrow from the mountains to the seaboard, in which the cars, like a following drill barrow, sprinkle all the restless men and floating merchandise in the country for seed. All day the fire steed flies over the country, stopping only that his master may rest, and I am awakened by his tramp and defiant snort at midnight, when in some remote glen in the woods he fronts the elements encased in ice and snow, 
and he will reach his stall only with the morning star, to start once more on his travels without rest or slumber. Or perchance at evening I hear him in his stable, blowing off the superfluous energy of the day, that he may calm his nerves and cool his liver and brain for a few hours of iron slumber. If the enterprise were as heroic and commanding as it is protracted and unwearied. Far through unfrequented woods on the confines of towns, where once only the hunter penetrated by day, in the darkest night dart these bright saloons, without the knowledge of their inhabitants. This moment stopping at some brilliant station house in town or city, where a social crowd is gathered, the next in the dismal swamp, scaring the owl and fox. The startings and arrivals of the cars are now the epochs in the village day. They go and come with such regularity and precision, and their whistle can be heard so far that the farmers set their clocks by them, and thus one well-conducted institution regulates a whole country. Have not men improved somewhat in punctuality since the railroad was invented? Did they not talk and think faster in the depot than they did in the stage office? There is something electrifying in the atmosphere of the former place. I have been astonished at the miracles it has wrought, that some of my neighbors who, I should have prophesied once for all, would never get to Boston by so prompt a conveyance, are on hand when the bell rings. To do things railroad fashion is now the byword, and it is worth the while to be warned so often and so sincerely by any power to get off its track. There is no stopping to read the riot act, no firing over the heads of the mob in this case. We have constructed we have constructed a fate, an atropos, that never turns aside. Let that be the name of your engine. Men are advertised that at a certain hour and minute these bolts will be shot toward particular points of the compass. Yet it interferes with no man's business, and the children go to school on the other track. We live the steadier for it. We are all educated thus to be sons of tell. The air is full of invisible bolts. Every path but your own is the path of fate. Keep on your own track, then. What recommends commerce to me is its enterprise and bravery. It does not clasp its hands and pray to Jupiter. I see these men every day go about their business with more or less courage and content, doing more even than they suspect, and perchance better employed than they could have consciously devised. I am less affected by their heroism, who stood up for half an hour in the front line at Buena Vista, than by the steady and cheerful valor of the men who inhabit the snow-plough for their winter quarters, who have not merely the three o'clock in the morning courage, which Bonaparte thought was the rarest, but whose courage does not go to rest so early, who go to sleep only when the storm sleeps or the sinews of their iron steed are frozen. On this morning of the great snow, perchance, which is still raging and chilling men's blood, I bear the muffled tone of their engine-bell 
from out the fog-bank of their chilled breath, which announces that the cars are coming. Without long delay, notwithstanding the veto of a New England northeast snowstorm, and I behold the plowmen, covered with snow and rime, their heads peering above the mold board which is turning down other than daisies in the nests of field mice, like boulders of the Sierra Nevada that occupy an outside place in the universe. Commerce is unexpectedly confident and serene, alert, adventurous, and unwearied. It is very natural in its methods withal, far more so than many fantastic enterprises and sentimental experiments, and hence its singular success. I am refreshed and expanded when the freight train rattles past me, and I smell the stores which go dispensing their odors all the way from Long Wharf to Lake Champlain, reminding me of foreign parts, of coral reefs and Indian oceans and tropical climes and the extent of the globe. I feel more like a citizen of the world at the sight of the palm-leaf which will cover so many flaxen New England heads the next summer, the manila hemp, and coconut husks, the old junk, gunny bags, scrap iron and rusty nails. This carload of torn sails is more legible and interesting now than if they should be wrought into paper and printed books. Who can write so graphically the history of the storms they have weathered as these rents have done? They are proof-sheets which need no correction. Here goes lumber from the main woods, which did not go out to sea in the last freshet, risen four dollars on the thousand because of what did go out or was split up. Pine, spruce, cedar, first, second, third, and fourth qualities, so lately all of one quality, to wave over the bear and moose and caribou. Next rolls Thomaston Lime, a prime lot, which will get far among the hills before it gets slacked. These rags and bales of all hues and qualities, the lowest condition to which cotton and linen descend, the final result of dress, of patterns which are now no longer cried up, unless it be in Milwaukee, as those splendid articles, English, French, or American prints, ginghams, muslins, etc., gathered from all quarters both of fashion and poverty, going to become paper of one color, or a few shades only, on which forsooth will be written tales of real life, high and low, and founded on fact. This closed car smells of salt fish, the strong New England and commercial scent, reminding me of the grand banks and the fisheries. Who has not seen a salt fish thoroughly cured for this world, so that nothing can spoil it, and putting the perseverance of the saints to blush? with which you may sweep or pave the streets and split your kindlings, and the teamster shelter himself and his lading against sun, wind, and rain behind it, and the trader, as a Concord trader once did, hang it up by his door for a sign when he commences business, until at last his oldest customer cannot tell surely whether it be animal, vegetable, or mineral and yet it shall be as pure as a snowflake, and if it be but put into a pot and boiled will come out an excellent dunfish for a Saturday's dinner. Next, Spanish hides, with the tails still preserving their twist 
and the angle of elevation they had when the oxen that wore them were careering over the pampas of the Spanish main, a type of all obstinacy, and evincing how almost hopeless and incurable are all constitutional vices. I confess that, practically speaking, when I have learned a man's real disposition, I have no hopes of changing it for the better or worse in this state of existence. As the Orientals say, a cur's tail may be warmed and pressed and bound round with ligatures, and after a twelve years' labor bestowed upon it, still it will retain its natural form. The only effectual cure for such inveteracies as these tales exhibit is to make glue of them, which I believe is what is usually done with them, and then they will stay put and stick. Here is a hog's head of molasses, or of brandy, directed to John Smith, Cuttingsville, Vermont some trader among the green mountains, who imports for the farmers near his clearing, and now perchance stands over his bulkhead and thinks of the last arrivals on the coast, how they may affect the price for him, telling his customers this moment, as he has told them twenty times before this morning, that he expects some by the next train of prime quality. It is advertised in the Cuttingsville Times." While these things go up, other things come down. Warned by the whizzing sound, I look up from my book and see some tall pine hewn on far northern hills, which has winged its way over the green mountains and the Connecticut, shot like an arrow through the township within ten minutes, and scarce another eye beholds it going to be the mast of some great admiral. And hark, here comes the cattle train, bearing the cattle of a thousand hills, sheep cots, stables, and cow yards in the air, drovers with their sticks and shepherd boys in the midst of their flocks, all but the mountain pastures, whirled along like leaves blown from the mountains by the September gale. The air is filled with the bleating of calves and sheep and the hustling of oxen, as if a pastoral valley were going by. When the old bell-weather at the head rattles his bell, the mountains do indeed skip like rams and the little hills like lambs. A carload of drovers, too, in the midst on a level with their droves now, their vocation gone, but still clinging to their useless sticks as their badge of office. But their dogs, where are they? It is a stampede to them. They are quite thrown out. They have lost the scent. Methinks I hear them barking behind the Peterborough hills, or panting up the western slope of the green mountains. They will not be in at the death. Their vocation, too, is gone. Their fidelity and sagacity are below par now. They will slink back to their kennels in disgrace, or perchance run wild and strike a league with the wolf and the fox. So is your pastoral life world past and away. But the bell rings, and I must get off the track and let the cars go by. What's the railroad to me? I never go to see where it ends. It fills a few hollows and makes banks for the swallows. It sets the sand a-blowing and the blackberries a-growing. But I cross it like a cart-path in the woods. I will not have my eyes put out and my ears spoiled by its smoke and steam and hissing. Now that the cars are gone by and all the restless world with them, 
and the fishes in the pond no longer feel their rumbling. I am more alone than ever. For the rest of the long afternoon, perhaps, my meditations are interrupted only by the faint rattle of a carriage or team along the distant highway. Sometimes, on Sundays, I heard the bells, the Lincoln, Acton, Bedford, or Concord bell, when the wind was favorable, a faint, sweet, and, as it were, natural melody worth importing into the wilderness. At a sufficient distance over the woods this sound acquires a certain vibratory hum, as if the pine needles in the horizon were the strings of a harp which it swept. All sound heard at the greatest possible distance produces one and the same effect, a vibration of the universal lyre, just as the intervening atmosphere makes a distant ridge of earth interesting to our eyes by the azure tint it imparts to it. There came to me in this case a melody which the air had strained, and which had conversed with every leaf and needle of the wood, that portion of the sound which the elements had taken up and modulated and echoed from vale to vale. The echo is, to some extent, an original sound, and therein is the magic and charm of it. It is not merely a repetition of what was worth repeating in the bell, but partly the voice of the wood, the same trivial words and notes sung by a wood-nymph. At evening the distant lowing of some cow in the horizon beyond the woods sounded sweet and melodious, and at first I would mistake it for the voices of certain minstrels, by whom I was sometimes serenaded who might be straying over hill and dale, but soon I was not unpleasantly disappointed when it was prolonged into the cheap and natural music of the cow. I do not mean to be satirical, but to express my appreciation of those youths singing when I state that I perceived clearly that it was akin to the music of the cow, and they were at length one articulation of nature. Regularly at half-past seven in one part of the summer, after the evening train had gone by, the whippoorwills chanted their vespers for half an hour, sitting on a stump by my door, or upon the ridge-pole of the house. They would begin to sing almost with as much precision as a clock. Within five minutes of a particular time, referred to the setting of the sun every evening. I had a rare opportunity to become acquainted with their habits. Sometimes I heard four or five at once in different parts of the wood, by accident one a bar behind another, and so near me that I distinguished not only the cluck after each note, but often that singular buzzing sound like a fly in a spider's web, only proportionally louder. Sometimes one would circle round and round me in the woods, a few feet distance as if tethered by a string, when probably I was near its eggs. They sang at intervals throughout the night, and were again as musical as ever, just before and about the dawn. When other birds are still, the screech-owls take up the strain, like mourning women with their ancient ululu. Their dismal scream is truly Ben Johnsonian, wise midnight hags. It is no honest and blunt to wit to woo of the poets, but without jesting, a most solemn graveyard ditty. The mutual consolations of suicide lovers 
remembering the pangs and the delights of supernal love in the infernal groves. Did I love to hear their wailing, their doleful responses trilled along the woodside, reminding me sometimes of music and singing birds, as if it were the dark and tearful side of music, the regrets and sighs that would fain be sung. They are the spirits, the low spirits and melancholy forebodings of fallen souls that once in human shape night walked the earth and did the deeds of darkness, now expiating their sins with their wailing hymns or threnodies in the scenery of their transgressions. They give me a new sense of the variety and capacity of that nature which is our common dwelling. Oh, oh, that I never had been born, sighs one on this side of the pond, and circles with the restlessness of despair to some new perch on the gray oaks, then that I had never been born, echoes another on the farther side with tremulous sincerity, and born comes faintly from far in the Lincoln woods. I was also serenaded by a hooting owl. Near at hand you could fancy it the most melancholy sound in nature, as if she meant by this to stereotype and make permanent in her choir the dying moans of a human being, some poor, weak relic of mortality who has left hope behind and howls like an animal, yet with human sobs on entering the dark valley, made more awful by a certain gurgling melodiousness. I find myself beginning with the letters G, L when I try to imitate it, expressive of a mind which has reached the gelatinous, mildewy stage in the mortification of all healthy and courageous thought. It reminded me of ghouls and idiots and insane howlings. But now one answers from far woods in a strain made really melodious by distance. Hoo, 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 hoo. And indeed, for the most part of it, suggested only by pleasing associations, whether heard by day or night, summer or winter. I rejoice that there are owls. Let them do the idiotic and maniacal hooting for men. It is a sound admirably suited to swamps and twilight woods which no day illustrates, suggesting a vast and undeveloped nature which men have not recognized. They represent the stark twilight and unsatisfied thoughts which all have. All day the sun has shone on the surface of some savage swamp where the single spruce stands hung with usnea lichens and small hawks circulate above and the chickadee lisps amid the evergreens and the partridge and rabbit skulk beneath. But now a more dismal and fitting day dawns and a different race of creatures awakes to express the meaning of nature there. Late in the evening I heard the distant rumbling of wagons over bridges, a sound heard farther than almost any other at night, the baying of dogs, and sometimes again the lowing of some disconsolate cow in a distant barnyard, in the meanwhile all the shore rang with the trump of bullfrogs, the sturdy spirits of ancient wine-bibers and wassailers, still unrepentant, 
trying to sing a catch in their Stygian lake. If the Walden nymphs will pardon the comparison, for though there are almost no weeds, there are frogs there, who would fain keep up the hilarious rules of their old festal tables, though their voices have waxed hoarse and solemnly grave, mocking at mirth, and the wine has lost its flavor, and become only liquor to distend their paunches, and sweet intoxication never comes to drown the memory of the past but mere saturation and water-loggedness and distension. The almost aldermanic, with his chin upon a heart-leaf which serves for a napkin to his drooling chaps, under this northern shore quaffs a deep draught of the once scorned water and passes round the cup with ejaculation Trunk, 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 and straightway comes over the water from some distant cove the same password repeated, where the next in seniority and girth has gulped down to his mark, and when this observance has made the circuit of the shores, there ejaculates the master of ceremonies with satisfaction, Drunk. And each in his turn repeats the same down to the least distended, leakiest, and flabbiest paunched, that there be no mistake. And then the howl goes round again and again, until the sun disperses the morning mist, and only the patriarch is not under the pond, but vainly bellowing tronk from time to time, and pausing for a reply. I am not sure that I ever heard the sound of cock crowing from my clearing, and I thought that it might be worth a while to keep a cockerel for his music merely as a singing bird. The note of this once wild Indian pheasant is certainly the most remarkable of any birds, and if they could be naturalized without being domesticated, it would soon become the most famous sound in our woods, surpassing the clangor of the goose and the hooting of the owl, and then imagine the cackling of the hens to fill the pauses when their lord's clarions rested. No wonder that man added this bird to his tame stock, to say nothing of the eggs and drumsticks. To walk in a winter morning in a wood where these birds abounded, their native woods, and hear the wild cockerels crow on the trees, clear and shrill for miles over the resounding earth, drowning the feebler notes of other birds. Think of it. It would put nations on the alert who would not be early to rise, and rise earlier and earlier every successive day of his life, till he became unspeakably healthy, wealthy, and wise. This foreign bird's note is celebrated by the poets of all countries, along with the notes of their native songsters. All climates agree with brave Chanticleer. He is more indigenous even than the natives. His health is ever good, his lungs are sound, his spirits never flag. Even the sailor on the Atlantic and Pacific is awakened by his voice. But its shrill sound never roused me from my slumbers. I kept neither dog, cat, cow, pig, nor hens, so that you would have said there was a deficiency of domestic sounds. Neither the churn, nor the spinning wheel, nor even the singing of the kettle, nor the hissing of the urn, and nor children crying to comfort one. An old-fashioned man would have lost his senses and died of ennui before this. Not even rats in the wall, for they were starved out, or rather were never baited in. Only squirrels on the roof and under the floor, a whippoorwill on the ridge-pole, a blue jay screaming beneath the window, 
a hare or woodchuck under the house, a screech owl or a cat owl behind it, a flock of wild geese or a laughing loon on the pond, and a fox to bark in the night. Not even a lark or an oriole, those mild plantation birds, ever visited my clearing. No cockerels to crow, nor hens to cackle in the yard. No yard, but unfenced nature, reaching up to your very sills. A young forest growing up under your meadows, and wild sumacs and blackberry vines breaking through into your cellar. Sturdy pitch pines rubbing and creaking against the shingles for want of room, their roots reaching quite under the house. Instead of a scuttle or a blind blown off in the gale, a pine tree snapped off or torn up by the roots behind your house for fuel. Instead of no path to the front yard gate in the great snow, no gate, no front yard, and no path to the civilized world. End of chapter 4「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Walden. Chapter 5. Solitude. This is a delicious evening, when the whole body is one sense, and imbibes delight through every pore. I go and come with a strange liberty in nature, a part of herself. As I walk along the stony shore of the pond in my shirt sleeves, though it is cool as well as cloudy and windy, and I see nothing special to attract me, all the elements are unusually congenial to me. The bullfrogs trump to usher in the night, and the note of the whippoorwill is born on the rippling wind from over the water. Sympathy with the fluttering alder and poplar leaves almost takes away my breath. Yet, like the lake, my serenity is rippled, but not ruffled. These small waves, raised by the evening wind, are as remote from storm as the smooth reflecting surface. Though it is now dark, the wind still blows and roars in the wood, the waves still dash, and some creatures lull the rest with their notes. The repose is never complete. The wildest animals do not repose, but seek their prey now, the fox and skunk and rabbit, now roam the fields and woods without fear. They are nature's watchmen, links which connect the days of animated life. When I return to my house I find that visitors have been there and left their cards, either a bunch of flowers or a wreath of evergreen, or a name in pencil on a yellow walnut leaf or a chip. They who come rarely to the woods take some little piece of the forest into their hands to play with by the way, which they leave, either intentionally or accidentally. One has peeled a willow wand, woven it into a ring, and dropped it on my table. I could always tell if visitors had called in my absence, either by the bended twigs or grass or the print of their shoes, and generally of what sex or age or quality they were, by 
some slight trace left, as a flower dropped or a bunch of grass plucked and then thrown away, even as far off as the railroad half a mile distant, or by the lingering odor of a cigar or pipe. Nay, I was frequently notified of the passage of a traveller along the highway sixty rods off by the scent of his pipe. There is commonly sufficient space about us. Our horizon is never quite at our elbows. The thick wood is not just at our door, nor the pond, but somewhat is always clearing familiar and worn by us, appropriated and fenced in some way, and reclaimed from nature. For what reason have I this vast range and circuit, some square miles of unfrequented forest for my privacy, abandoned to me by men? My nearest neighbor is a mile distant, and no house is visible from any place but the hilltops within half a mile of my own. I have my horizon bounded by woods all to myself. A distant view of the railroad where it touches the pond on the one hand, and of the fence which skirts the woodland road on the other. But for the most part it is as solitary where I live as on the prairies. It is as much Asia or Africa as New England. I have, as it were, my own sun and moon and stars, and a little world all to myself. At night there was never a traveler past my house or knocked at my door more than if I were the first or last man, unless it were in the spring, when at long intervals some came from the village to fish for pouts. They plainly fished much more in the Walden pond of their own natures, and baited their hooks with darkness. But they soon retreated, usually with light baskets, and left the world to darkness and to me, and the black kernel of the night was never profaned by any human neighborhood. I believe that men are generally still a little afraid of the dark, though the witches are all hung and Christianity and candles have been introduced. Yet I experienced sometimes that the most sweet and tender, the most innocent and encouraging society may be found in any natural object, even for the poor misanthrope and most melancholy man. There can be no very black melancholy to him who lives in the midst of nature and has his senses still. There was never yet such a storm but it was aeolian music to a healthy and innocent ear. Nothing can rightly compel a simple and brave man to a vulgar sadness. While I enjoy the friendship of the seasons, I trust that nothing can make life a burden to me. The gentle rain which waters my beans and keeps me in the house today is not drear and melancholy, but good for me too. Though it prevents me hoeing them, it is of far more worth than my hoeing. If it should continue so long as to cause the seeds to rot in the ground, and destroy the potatoes in the low lands, it would still be good for the grass on the uplands and being good for the grass, it would be good for me. Sometimes, when I compare myself with other men, it seems as if I were more favored by the gods than they, beyond any deserts that I am conscious of, as if I had a warrant and surety at their hands, 
which my fellows have not, and were especially guided and guarded. I do not flatter myself, but if it be possible, they flatter me. I have never felt lonesome, or in the least oppressed by a sense of solitude, but once, and that was a few weeks after I came to the woods when, for an hour, I doubted if the near neighborhood of man was not essential to a serene and healthy life. To be alone was something unpleasant. But I was at the same time conscious of a slight insanity in my mood, and seemed to foresee my recovery. In the midst of a gentle rain, while these thoughts prevailed, I was suddenly sensible of such sweet and beneficent society in nature, in the very pattering of the drops, and in every sound and sight around my house, an infinite and unaccountable friendliness, all at once like an atmosphere sustaining me, as made the fancied advantages of human neighborhood insufficient. And I have never thought of them since. Every little pine needle expanded and swelled with sympathy and befriended me, I was so distinctly made aware of the presence of something kindred to me, even in scenes which we are accustomed to call wild and dreary, and also that the nearest of blood to me, and humanist, was not a person nor a villager, that I thought no place could ever be strange to me again. Morning untimely consumes the sad, Few are their days in the land of the living, beautiful daughter of Toscar. Some of my pleasantest hours were during the long rainstorms in the spring or fall, which confined me to the house for the afternoon as well as the forenoon, soothed by their ceaseless roar and pelting, when an early twilight ushered in a long evening in which many thoughts had time to take root and unfold themselves. In those driving northeast rains, which tried the village houses so, when the maid stood ready with mop and pail in front entries to keep the deluge out, I sat behind my door in my little house, which was all entry, and thoroughly enjoyed its protection. In one heavy thunder shower, the lightning struck a large pitch pine across the pond, making a very conspicuous and perfectly regular spiral groove from top to bottom an inch or more deep, and four or five inches wide, as you would groove a walking stick. I passed it again the other day and was struck with awe on looking up and beholding that mark now more distinct than ever, where a terrific and resistless bolt came down out of the harmless sky eight years ago. Men frequently say to me, I should think you would feel lonesome down there and want to be nearer to folks rainy and sunny days and nights especially. I am tempted to reply to such, This whole earth which we inhabit is but a point in space. How far apart, think you, dwell the two most distant inhabitants of yonder star the breadth of whose disk cannot be appreciated by our instruments. Why should I feel lonely? Is not our planet in the Milky Way? This which you put seems to me 
not to be the most important question. What sort of space is that which separates a man from his fellows, and makes him solitary? I have found that no exertion of the legs can bring two minds much nearer to one another. What do we want most to dwell near to? Not to many men, surely, the depot, the post office, the bar room, the meeting house, the school house, the grocery, Beacon Hill, or the five points, where men most congregate, but to the perennial source of our life, whence in all our experience we have found that to issue, as the willow stands near the water and sends out its roots in that direction, this will vary with different natures, but this is the place where a wise man will dig his cellar. I one evening overtook one of my townsmen who has accumulated what is called a handsome property, though I never got a fair view of it, on the Walden Road, driving a pair of cattle to market, who inquired of me how I could bring my mind to give up so many of the comforts of life. I answered that I was very sure I liked it passably well. I was not joking, and so I went home to my bed, and left him to pick his way through the darkness and the mud to Brighton, or Bright Town, which place he would reach some time in the morning. Any prospect of awakening, or coming to life to a dead man, makes indifferent all times and places. The place where that may occur is always the same, and indescribably pleasant to all our senses. For the most part we allow only outlying and transient circumstances to make our occasions. They are, in fact, the cause of our distraction. Nearest to all things is that power which fashions their being. Next to us the grandest laws are continually being executed. Next to us is not the workman whom we have hired, with whom we love so well to talk, but the workman whose work we are. How vast and profound is the influence of the subtle powers of heaven and of earth. We seek to perceive them, and we do not see them. We seek to hear them, and we do not hear them identified with the substance of things, they cannot be separated from them. They cause that in all the universe men purify and sanctify their hearts, and clothe themselves in their holiday garments to offer sacrifices and oblations to their ancestors. It is an ocean of subtle intelligences they are everywhere, above us, on our left, on our right. They environ us on all sides. We are the subjects of an experiment, which is not a little interesting to me. Can we not do without the society of our gossips a little while under these circumstances? have our own thoughts to cheer us? Confucius says truly, Virtue does not remain as an abandoned orphan. It must of necessity have neighbors. With thinking, 
we may be beside ourselves in a sane sense. By a conscious effort of the mind, we can stand aloof from actions and their consequences, and all things, good and bad, go by us like a torrent. We are not wholly involved in nature. I may be either the driftwood in the stream, or Indra in the sky looking down on it. I may be affected by a theatrical exhibition. On the other hand, I may not be affected by an actual event which appears to concern me much more. I only know myself as a human entity, the scene, so to speak, of thoughts and affections, and am sensible of a certain doubleness by which I can stand as remote from myself as from another. However intense my experience, I am conscious of the presence and criticism of a part of me, which, as it were, is not a part of me, but spectator, sharing no experience, but taking note of it. And that is no more I than it is you. When the play, it may be the tragedy, of life is over, the spectator goes his way. It was a kind of fiction, a work of the imagination only, so far as he was concerned. This doubleness may easily make us poor neighbors and friends sometimes. I find it wholesome to be alone the greater part of the time. To be in company even with the best is soon wearisome and dissipating. I love to be alone. I never found the companion that was so companionable as solitude. We are for the most part more lonely when we go abroad among men than when we stay in our own chambers. A man thinking or working is always alone. Let him be where he will. Solitude is not measured by the miles of space that intervene between a man and his fellows. The really diligent student in one of the crowded hives of Cambridge College is as solitary as a dervish in the desert. The farmer can work alone in the field or the woods all day, hoeing or chopping, and not feel lonesome, because he is employed. But when he comes home at night he cannot sit down in a room alone, at the mercy of his thoughts, but must be where he can see the folks, and recreate, and, as he thinks, remunerate himself for his day's solitude. And hence he wonders how the student can sit alone in the house all night and most of the day without ennui and the blues. But he does not realize that the student, though in the house, is still at work in his field and chopping in his woods, as the farmer in his, and in turn seeks the same recreation and society that the latter does, though it may be a more condensed form of it. Society is commonly too cheap. We meet at very short intervals, not having had time to acquire any new value for each other, we meet at meals three times a day, and give each other a new taste of that old musty cheese that we are, 
we have had to agree on a certain set of rules, called etiquette and politeness, to make this frequent meeting tolerable, and that we need not come to open war, we meet at the post-office, and at the sociable, and about the fireside every night. We live thick, and are in each other's way, and stumble over one another, and I think that we thus lose some respect for one another. Certainly less frequency would suffice for all important and hearty communications. Consider the girls in a factory, never alone, hardly in their dreams. It would be better if they were but one inhabitant to a square mile as where I live. The value of a man is not in his skin that we should touch him. I have heard of a man lost in the woods and dying of famine and exhaustion at the foot of a tree whose loneliness was relieved by the grotesque visions with which, owing to bodily weakness, his diseased imagination surrounded him, and which he believed to be real. So also, owing to bodily and mental health and strength, we may be continually cheered by a like but more normal and natural society, and come to know that we are never alone. I have a great deal of company in my house, especially in the morning, when nobody calls. Let me suggest a few comparisons, that someone may convey an idea of my situation. I am no more lonely than the loon in the pond that laughs so loud, or than Walden Pond itself. What company has that lonely lake, I pray? And yet it has not the blue devils, but the blue angels in it, in the azure tint of its waters. The sun is alone, except in thick weather when there sometimes appear to be two, but one is a mock sun. God is alone, but the devil he is far from being alone. He sees a great deal of company. He is legion. I am no more lonely than a single mullen, or dandelion in a pasture, or a bean-leaf, or a sorrel, or a horse-fly, or a bumblebee. I am no more lonely than the mill-brook, or a weathercock, or the north star, or the south wind, or an April shower, or a January thaw, or the first spider in a new house. I have occasional visits in the long winter evenings, when the snow falls fast and the wind howls in the wood, from an old settler and original proprietor who is reported to have dug Walden Pond and stoned it and fringed it with pine woods, who tells me stories of old time and new eternity, and between us we manage to pass a cheerful evening with social mirth and pleasant views of things, even without apples or cider. A most wise and humorous friend, whom I love much, who keeps himself more secret than ever did Goff or Whaley, and though he is thought to be dead, none can show where he is buried. An elderly dame, too, dwells in my neighborhood, invisible to most persons, in whose odorous herb garden I love to stroll sometimes, gathering simples and listening to her fables, for she has a genius of unequaled fertility, and her memory runs back farther than mythology, and she can tell me the original of every fable, and on what fact every one is founded, for the incidents occurred when she was young. A ruddy and lusty old dame, 
who delights in all weathers and seasons, and is likely to outlive all her children yet. The indescribable innocence and beneficence of nature, of sun and wind and rain, of summer and winter, such health, such cheer they afford for ever, and such sympathy have they ever with our race, that all nature would be affected, and the sun's brightness fade, and the winds would sigh humanely, and the clouds rain tears, and the woods shed their leaves, and put on mourning in midsummer, if any man should ever for a just cause grieve. Shall I not have intelligence with the earth? Am I not partly leaves and vegetable mold myself? What is the pill which keeps us well, serene, contented? Not my or thy great-grandfather's, but our great-grandmother nature's universal, vegetable, botanic medicines, by which she has kept herself young always, outlived so many old pars in her day, and fed her health with their decaying fatness. For my panacea, instead of one of those quack vials of a mixture dipped from Acheron and the Dead Sea, which come out of those long, shallow, black schooner-looking wagons which we sometimes see made to carry bottles, let me have a draught of undiluted morning air. Morning air! If men will not drink of this at the fountainhead of the day, why then, we must even bottle up some and sell it in the shops, for the benefit of those who have lost their subscription ticket to morning time in this world. But remember, it will not keep quite till noonday, even in the coolest cellar, but drive out the stopples long ere that, and follow westward the steps of Aurora. I am no worshipper of Hygieia, who was the daughter of that old herb-doctor Esculapius, and who is represented on monuments holding a serpent in one hand, and in the other a cup, out of which the serpent sometimes drinks, but rather of Heb, cup-bearer to Jupiter, who was the daughter of Juno and wild lettuce, and who had the power of restoring gods and men to the vigor of youth. She was probably the only thoroughly sound, conditioned, healthy, and robust young lady that ever walked to the globe, and wherever she came it was spring. End of chapter 5「This is a reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Chapter six Visitors. I think that I love society as much as most and am ready enough to fasten myself like a bloodsucker for the time to any full-blooded man that comes in my way. I am naturally no hermit, but might possibly sit out the sturdiest frequenter of the bar-room, if my business called me thither. I had three chairs in my house, one for solitude, two for friendship, three for society. When visitors came in larger and unexpected numbers, there was but the third chair for them all, but they generally economized the room by standing up. 
It is surprising how many great men and women a small house will contain. I have had twenty-five or thirty souls, with their bodies at once under my roof, and yet we often parted without being aware that we had come very near to one another. Many of our houses, both public and private, with their almost innumerable apartments, their huge halls and their cellars for the storage of wines and other munitions of peace, appear to be extravagantly large for their inhabitants. They are so vast and magnificent that the latter seem to be only vermin which infest them. I am surprised when the herald blows his summons before some Tremont or Astor or Middlesex house to see come creeping out over the piazza, for all inhabitants a ridiculous mouse, which soon again slinks into some hole in the pavement. One inconvenience I sometimes experienced in so small a house, the difficulty of getting to a sufficient distance from my guest when we began to utter the big thoughts in big words. You want room for your thoughts to get into sailing trim and run a course or two before they make their port. The bullet of your thought must have overcome its lateral and ricochet motion and fallen into its last and steady course before it reaches the ear of the hearer, else it may plough out again through the side of his head. Also our sentences wanted room to unfold and form their columns in the interval. Individuals, like nations, must have suitable broad and natural boundaries, even a considerable neutral ground between them. I have found it a singular luxury to talk across the pond to a companion on the opposite side. In my house we were so near that we could not begin to hear, we could not speak low enough uh, to be heard. As when you throw two stones into calm water so near that they break each other's undulations. If we are merely loquacious and loud talkers, then we can afford to stand very near together, cheek by jowl, and feel each other's breath. But if we speak reservedly and thoughtfully, we must be farther apart, that all animal heat and moisture may have a chance to evaporate. If we would enjoy the most intimate society with that in each of us which is without, or above, being spoken to, we must not only be silent, but commonly so far apart bodily that we cannot possibly hear each other's voice in any case. Referred to this standard, speech is for the convenience of those who are hard of hearing, but there are many fine things which we cannot say if we have to shout. As the conversation began to assume a loftier and grander tone, we gradually shoved our chairs farther apart, till they touched the wall in opposite corners, and then commonly there was not room enough. My best room, however, my withdrawing room, always ready for company, on whose carpet the sun rarely fell, was the pine wood behind my house. Thither in summer days, when distinguished guests came, I took them and a priceless domestic swept the floor and dusted the furniture and kept the things in order. If one guest came, he sometimes partook of my frugal meal, and it was no interruption to conversation to be stirring a hasty pudding or watching the rising and maturing of a loaf of bread in the ashes in the meanwhile. But if twenty came and sat in my house, there was nothing said about dinner, though there might be bread enough for two, more than if eating were a forsaken habit. But we naturally practiced abstinence, and this was never felt to be an offense against hospitality, but the most proper and considerate course. The waste and decay of physical life which so often needs repair seemed miraculously retarded in such a case, and the vital vigor stood its ground. I could entertain thus a thousand as well as twenty, and if any ever went away disappointed or hungry from my house when they found me at home, they may depend upon it that I sympathized with them at least. So easy is it, though many housekeepers doubt it, to establish new and better customs in the place of the old. You need not rest your reputation on the dinners you give. 
For my own part, I was never so effectually deterred from frequenting a man's house by any kind of Cerberus whatever as by the parade one made about dining me, which I took to be a very polite and roundabout hint never to trouble him so again. I think I shall never revisit those scenes. I should be proud to have, for the motto of my cabin, those lines of Spencer, which one of my visitors inscribed on a yellow walnut leaf for a card. Arrived there, the little house they fill. Ne look for entertainment where none was. Rest is their feast, and all things at their will. The noblest mind the best contentment has. When Winslow, afterward governor of the Plymouth colony, went with a companion on a visit of ceremony to Massasoit on foot through the woods, and arrived tired and hungry at his lodge, they were well received by the king, but nothing was said about eating that day. When the knight arrived, to quote their own words, he laid us on the bed with himself and his wife, they at the one end and we at the other, it being only planks laid a foot from the ground and a thin mat upon them. Two more of his chief men, for want of room, pressed by and upon us, so that we were worse weary of our lodging than of our journey. At one o'clock the next day Massasoit brought two fishes that he had shot about thrice as big as a bream. These being boiled, there were at least forty looked for a share in them, the most eat of them. This meal only we had in two nights and a day, and had not one of us brought a partridge, we had taken our journey fasting. Fearing that they would be light-headed for want of food and also sleep, owing to the savages' barbarous singing, for they used to sing themselves to sleep, and that they might get home while they had strength to travel, they departed. As for lodging, it is true they were but poorly entertained, though what they found an inconvenience was no doubt intended for an honor. But as far as eating was concerned, I do not see how the Indians could have done better. They had nothing to eat themselves." and they were wiser than to think that apologies could supply the place of food to their guests. So they drew their belts tighter and said nothing about it. Another time, when Winslow visited them, it being a season of plenty with them, there was no deficiency in this respect. As for men, they will hardly fail one anywhere. I had more visitors while I lived in the woods than at any other period in my life. I mean that I had some. I met several there under more favorable circumstances than I could anywhere else. But fewer came to see me on trivial business. In this respect my company was winnowed by my mere distance from town. I had withdrawn so far within the great ocean of solitude, into which the rivers of society empty, that for the most part so far as my needs were concerned, only the finest sediment was deposited around me. Beside, there were wafted to me evidences of unexplored and uncultivated continents on the other side. Who should come to my lodge this morning but a true Homeric or Paphlagonian man? He had so suitable and poetic a name that I am sorry I cannot print it here a Canadian, a woodchopper and postmaker, who can hold fifty posts in a day, who made his last supper on a woodchuck which his dog caught. He too has heard of Homer, and, if it were not for books, would not know what to do rainy days, though perhaps he has not read one wholly through for many rainy seasons. Some priest who could pronounce the Greek itself taught him to read his verse in the testament in his native parish far away, and now I must translate to him while he holds the book Achilles' Reproof to Patroclus for his sad countenance. Why are you in tears, Patroclus, like a young girl, or have you alone heard some news from Pythia? 
They say that Minutius lives yet, son of Actor, and Peleus lives, son of Achus, among the Myrmidons, either of whom, having died, we should greatly grieve. He says, that's good. He has a great bundle of white oak bark under his arm for a sick man gathered this Sunday morning. I suppose there's no harm in going after such a thing today, says he. To him Homer was a great writer, though what his writing was about he did not know. A more simple and natural man it would be hard to find. Vice and disease, which cast such a somber moral hue over the world, seemed to have hardly any existence for him. He was about twenty-eight years old, and had left Canada and his father's house a dozen years before to work in the States, and earn money to buy a farm with that last, perhaps in his native country. He was cast in the coarsest mould, a stout but sluggish body, yet gracefully carried, with a thick sunburnt neck, dark bushy hair, and dull, sleepy blue eyes, which were occasionally lit up with expression. He wore a flat grey cloth cap, a dingy wool-coloured greatcoat, and cowhide boots. He was a great consumer of meat, usually carrying his dinner to his work a couple of miles past my house, for he chopped all summer, in a tin pail, cold meats, often cold woodchucks, and coffee in a stone bottle which dangled by a string from his belt, and sometimes he offered me a drink. He came along early, crossing my bean-field, though without anxiety or haste to get to his work, such as Yankees exhibit. He wasn't a-going to hurt himself. He didn't care if he only earned his board. Frequently he would leave his dinner in the bushes, when his dog had caught a woodchuck by the way, and go back a mile and a half to dress it and leave it in the cellar of the house where he boarded, after deliberating first for half an hour whether he could not sink it in the pond safely till nightfall. Loving to dwell long upon these themes, he would say as he went by in the morning, How thick the pigeons are! If working every day were not my trade, I could get all the meat I should want by hunting pigeons, woodchucks, rabbits, partridges. By gosh, I could get all I should want for a week and one day. He was a skillful chopper, and indulged in some flourishes and ornaments in his art. He cut his trees level and close to the ground, that the sprouts which came up afterward might be more vigorous, and a sled might slide over the stumps, and instead of leaving a whole tree to support his corded wood, he would pare it away to a slender stake or splinter, which you could break off with your hand at last. He interested me because he was so quiet and solitary and so happy withal, a well of good humor and contentment which overflowed at his eyes. His mirth was without alloy. Sometimes I saw him at his work in the woods, felling trees, and he would greet me with a laugh of inexpressible satisfaction and a salutation in Canadian French, though he spoke English as well. When I approached him he would suspend his work, and with half-suppressed mirth lie along the trunk of a pine which he had felled, and peeling off the inner bark, roll it up into a ball, and chew it while he laughed and talked. Such an exuberance of animal spirits had he, that he sometimes tumbled down and rolled on the ground with laughter at anything which made him think and tickled him. Looking round upon the trees, he would exclaim, "'By George, I can enjoy myself well enough here chopping. I want no better sport.' Sometimes, when at leisure, he amused himself all day in the woods with a pocket pistol, firing salutes to himself at regular intervals as he walked. In the winter, he had a fire by which at noon he warmed his coffee in a kettle, and as he sat on a log to eat his dinner, the chickadees would sometimes come round and alight on his arm and peck at the potato in his fingers, and he said that he liked to have the little fellers about him. In him the animal man chiefly was developed. 
in physical endurance and contentment he was cousin to the pine and the rock. I asked him once if he was not sometimes tired at night, after working all day. And he answered with a sincere and serious look, Gora Pitt, I never was tired in my life. But the intellectual and what is called spiritual man in him were slumbering, as in an infant. He had been instructed only in that innocent and ineffectual way in which the Catholic priests teach the aborigines, by which the pupil is never educated to the degree of consciousness, but only to the degree of trust and reverence, and a child is not made a man, but kept a child. When nature made him, she gave him a strong body, and contentment for his portion, and propped him on every side with reverence and reliance, that he might live out his threescore years and ten a child. He was so genuine and unsophisticated that no introduction would serve to introduce him, more than if you introduced a woodchuck to your neighbor. He had got to find him out as you did. He would not play any part. Men paid him wages for work, and so helped to feed and clothe him, but he never exchanged opinions with them. He was so simply and naturally humble, if he can be called humble who never aspires, that humility was no distinct quality in him, nor could he conceive of it. Wiser men were demigods to him. If you told him that such a one was coming, he did as if he thought that anything so grand would expect nothing of himself, but take all the responsibility on itself, and let him be forgotten still. He never heard the sound of praise. He particularly reverenced the writer and the preacher. Their performances were miracles. When I told him that I wrote considerably, he thought for a long time that it was merely the handwriting which I meant, for he could write a remarkably good hand himself. I sometimes found the name of his native parish handsomely written in the snow by the highway, with the proper French accent, and knew that he had passed. I asked him if he ever wished to write his thoughts. He said that he had read and written letters for those who could not, but he never tried to write thoughts. No, he could not. He could not tell what to put first. It would kill him, and then there was spelling to be attended to at the same time. I heard that a distinguished wise man and reformer asked him if he did not want the world to be changed, but he answered with a chuckle of surprise in his Canadian accent, not knowing that the question had ever been entertained before. Mm, no, I like it well enough. It would have suggested many things to a philosopher to have dealings with him. To a stranger he appeared to know nothing of things in general, yet I sometimes saw in him a man whom I had not seen before, and I did not know whether he was as wise as Shakespeare or as simply ignorant as a child whether to suspect him of a fine poetic consciousness, or of stupidity. A townsman told me that when he met him sauntering through the village in his small, close-fitting cap and whistling to himself, he reminded him of a prince in disguise. His only books were an almanac and an arithmetic, in which last he was considerably expert. The former was a sort of cyclopedia to him, which he supposed to contain an abstract of human knowledge, as indeed it does to a considerable extent. I loved to sound him on the various reforms of the day, and he never failed to look at them in the most simple and practical light. He had never heard of such things before. Could he do without factories, I asked? He had worn the Home-made Vermont Grey, he said, and that was good. Could he dispense with tea and coffee? Does this country afford any beverage beside water? He had soaked hemlock leaves in water and drank it, and thought that was better than water in warm weather. When I asked him if he could do without money, 
He showed the convenience of money in such a way as to suggest and coincide with the most philosophical accounts of the origin of this institution, and the very derivation of the word pecunia. If an ox were his property, and he wished to get needles and thread at the store, he thought it would be inconvenient and impossible soon to go on mortgaging some portion of the creature each time to that amount. He could defend many institutions better than any philosopher, because in describing them as they concerned him he gave the true reason for their prevalence, and speculation had not suggested to him any other. At another time, hearing Plato's definition of a man, a biped without feathers, and that one exhibited a cock plucked and called it Plato's man, he thought it an important difference that the knees bent the wrong way. He would sometimes exclaim, How I love to talk! By George, I could talk all day! I asked him once, when I had not seen him for many months, if he had got a new idea this summer. Good Lord, said he, a man that has to work as I do, if he does not forget the ideas he has had, he will do well. May be the man you hoe with is inclined to race. Then, by gory, your mind must be there. You think of weeds. He would sometimes ask me first on such occasions if I had made any improvement. One winter day I asked him if he was always satisfied with himself, wishing to suggest a substitute within him for the priest without, and some higher motive for living. Satisfied, said he. Some men are satisfied with one thing and some with another. One man, perhaps, if he has got enough, will be satisfied to sit all day with his back to the fire and his belly to the table. By George! Yet I never, by any maneuvering, could get him to take the spiritual view of things. The highest that he appeared to conceive of was a simple expediency, such as you might expect an animal to appreciate. And this, practically, is true of most men. If I suggested any improvement in his mode of life, he merely answered, without expressing any regret, that it was too late. Yet he thoroughly believed in honesty and the like virtues. There was a certain positive originality, however slight, to be detected in him, and I occasionally observed that he was thinking for himself and expressing his own opinion, a phenomenon so rare that I would any day walk ten miles to observe it, and it amounted to the re-origination of many of the institutions of society. Though he hesitated and perhaps failed to express himself distinctly, he always had a presentable thought behind. Yet his thinking was so primitive, and immersed in his animal life, that, though more promising than a merely learned man's, it rarely ripened to anything which can be reported. He suggested that there might be men of genius in the lowest grades of life, however permanently humble and illiterate, who take their own view always, or do not pretend to see at all, who are as bottomless even as Walden Pond was thought to be, though they may be dark and muddy. Many a traveller came out of his way to see me, in the inside of my house, and as an excuse for calling asked for a glass of water. I told them that I drank at the pond, and pointed thither, offering to lend them a dipper. Far off as I lived, I was not exempted from the annual visitation which occurs, methinks, about the first of April, when everybody is on the move, and I had my share of good luck, though there were some curious specimens among my visitors. Half-witted men from the alms-house and elsewhere came to see me, but I endeavoured to make them exercise all the wit they had, and make their confessions to me, in such case making wit the theme of our conversation, and so was compensated. Indeed, I found some of them to be wiser than the so-called overseers of the poor and select men of the town, and thought it was time that the tables were turned. With respect to wit, I learned that there was not much difference between the half 
and the whole. One day in particular, an inoffensive, simple-minded pauper, whom with others I had often seen used as fencing stuff, standing or sitting on a bushel in the fields to keep cattle and himself from straying, visited me and expressed a wish to live as I did. He told me, with the utmost simplicity and truth, quite superior, or rather inferior, to anything that is called humility, that he was deficient in intellect. These were his words. The Lord had made him so, yet he supposed the Lord cared as much for him as for another. I have always been so, said he, from my childhood. I never had much mind. I was not like other children. I am weak in the head. It was the Lord's will, I suppose. And there he was to prove the truth of his words. He was a metaphysical puzzle to me. I have rarely met a fellow man on such promising ground. It was so simple and sincere and so true all that he said, and true enough in proportion as he appeared to humble himself, was he exalted. I did not know at first, but it was the result of a wise policy. It seemed that from such a basis of truth and frankness as the poor weak-headed pauper had laid, our intercourse might go forward to something better than the intercourse of sages. I had some guests from those not reckoned commonly among the town's poor, but who should be, who are among the world's poor. At any rate, guests who appeal not to your hospitality, but to your hospitality, who earnestly wish to be helped, and preface their appeal with the information that they are resolved, for one thing, never to help themselves. I require of a visitor that he be not actually starving, though he may have the very best appetite in the world, however he got it. Objects of charity are not guests. Men who did not know when their visit had terminated, though I went about my business again, answering them from greater and greater remoteness, men of almost every degree of wit called on me in the migrating season, some who had more wits than they knew what to do with, runaway slaves with plantation manners, who listened from time to time like the fox in the fable, as if they heard the hounds obeying on their track, and looked at me beseechingly as much as to say, O oh, Christian, will you send me back? One real runaway slave, among the rest, whom I helped to forward toward the North Star, men of one idea, like a hen with one chicken, and that a duckling, men of a thousand ideas, and unkempt heads, like those hens which are made to take charge of a hundred chickens, all in pursuit of one bug, a score of them lost in every morning's dew and become frizzled and mangy in consequence. Men of ideas instead of legs, a sort of intellectual centipede that made you crawl all over. One man proposed a book in which visitors should write their names, as at the White Mountains, but, alas, I have too good a memory to make that necessary. I could not but notice some of the peculiarities of my visitors, Girls and boys and young women generally seemed glad to be in the woods. They looked in the pond and at the flowers and improved their time. Men of business, even farmers, thought only of solitude and employment, and of great distance at which I dwelt from something or other, and though they said that they loved a ramble in the woods occasionally, it was obvious that they did not. Restless, committed men whose time was taken up in getting a living or keeping it. Ministers who spoke of God as if they enjoyed a monopoly of the subject, who could not bear all kinds of opinions. Doctors, lawyers, uneasy housekeepers who pried into my cupboard and bed when I was out. How came Mrs. 
to know that my sheets were not as clean as hers. Young men, who had ceased to be young, and had concluded that it was safest to follow the beaten track of the professions, all these generally said that it was not possible to do so much good in my position. Ay, there was the rub. The old and infirm and the timid, of whatever age or sex, thought most of sickness, and sudden accident and death. To them life seemed full of danger. What danger is there if you don't think of any? And they thought that a prudent man would carefully select the safest position, where Dr. B. might be on hand at a moment's warning. To them the village was literally a community, a league for mutual defense, and you would suppose that they would not go a huckleberrying without a medicine chest. The amount of it is, if a man is alive, there is always danger that he may die, though the danger must be allowed to be less in proportion as he is dead and alive to begin with. A man sits as many risks as he runs. Finally, there were the self-styled reformers, the greatest bores of all, who thought that I was forever singing. This is the house that I built. This is the man that lives in the house that I built. But they did not know that the third line was, these are the folks that worry the man that lives in the house that I built. I did not fear the hen harriers, for I kept no chickens, but I feared the men harriers, rather. I had more cheering visitors than the last. Children come a-burying, railroad men taking a Sunday morning walk in clean shirts, fishermen and hunters, poets and philosophers. In short, all honest pilgrims, who came out to the woods for freedom's sake, and really left the village behind, I was ready to greet with. Welcome, Englishmen, welcome, Englishmen, for I had had communication with that race. End of chapter 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Chapter 7 The Bean Field. Meanwhile, my beans, the length of whose rows added together was seven miles already planted, were impatient to be hoed for the earliest had grown considerably before the latest were in the ground. Indeed, they were not easily to be put off. What was the meaning of this so steady and self-respecting, this small Herculean labor, I knew not. I came to love my rose, my beans, though so many more than I wanted. They attached me to the earth, and so I got strength, like Antaeus, but why should I raise them? Only heaven knows. This was my curious labor all summer, to make this portion of the earth's surface, which had yielded only sank foil, blackberries, John's wart, and the like before. Sweet wild fruits and pleasant flowers produce instead this pulse. What shall I learn of beans, or beans of me? I cherish them, I hoe them, early and late I have an eye to them, and this is my day's work. It is a fine, broad leaf to look on. My auxiliaries are the dews and rains which water this dry soil, and what fertility is in the soil itself, which for the most part is lean and effete. My enemies are worms, cool days, and most of all woodchucks. The last have nibbled for me a quarter of an acre clean. But what right had I to oust Johnswort and the rest and break up their ancient herb garden? 
Soon, however, the remaining beans will be too tough for them, and go forward to meet new foes. When I was four years old, as I well remember, I was brought from Boston to this my native town, through these very woods and this field, to the pond. It is one of the oldest scenes stamped on my memory. And now, to-night, my flute has waked the echoes over that very water. The pines still stand here older than I, or if some have fallen, I have cooked my supper with their stumps. And a new growth is rising all around, preparing another aspect for new infant eyes. Almost the same John Zwart springs from the same perennial root in this pasture. And even I have at length helped to clothe that fabulous landscape of my infant dreams. And one of the results of my presence and influence is seen in these bean leaves, corn blades, and potato vines. I planted about two acres and a half of upland, and as it was only about fifteen years since the land was cleared, and I myself had got out two or three cords of stumps, I did not give it any manure. But in the course of the summer it appeared by the arrowheads which I turned up in the hoeing, that an extinct nation had anciently dwelled here and planted corn and beans ere white men came to clear the land, and so to some extent had exhausted the soil for this very crop. Before yet any woodchuck or squirrel had run across the road or the sun had got above the shrub oaks, while all the dew was on, though the farmers warned me against it, I would advise you to do all your work, if possible, while the dew is on. I began to level the ranks of haughty weeds in my bean-field and throw dust upon their heads. Early in the morning I worked barefooted, dabbling like a plastic artist in the dewy and crumbling sand. But later in the day the sun blistered my feet. There the sun lighted me to hoe beans, pacing slowly backward and forward over that yellow gravelly upland between the long green rows, fifteen rods, the one end terminating in a shrub-oak copse where I could rest in the shade, the other in a blackberry field where the green berries deepened their tints by the time I had made another bout, removing the weeds, putting fresh soil about the bean stems, and encouraging this weed which I had sown, making the yellow soil express its summer thought in bean leaves and blossoms rather than in wormwood and piper and millet grass, making the earth say beans instead of grass. This was my daily work. As I had little aid from horses or cattle or hired men or boys or improved implements of husbandry, I was much slower and became much more intimate with my beans than usual. But labor of the hands, even when pursued to the verge of drudgery, is perhaps never the worst form of idleness. It has a constant and imperishable moral, and to the scholar it yields a classic result, a very agricola laboriosus, was I to travellers bound westward through Lincoln and Wayland to nobody knows where, they sitting at their ease in gigs with elbows on knees and reins loosely hanging in festoons, I the homestaying laborious native of the soil. But soon my homestead was out of their sight and thought. It was the only open and cultivated field for a great distance on either side of the road. So they made the most of it and sometimes the man in the field heard more of traveller's gossip and comment than was meant for his ear. "'Beans so late? Peas so late?' For I continued to plant when others had begun to hoe. The ministerial husbandman had not suspected it. "'Corn, my boy, for fodder, corn for fodder! Does he live there?' asks the black bonnet of the grey coat, 
and the hard-featured farmer reins up his grateful dobbin to inquire what you are doing where he sees no manure in the furrow, and recommends a little chip dirt or any little waste stuff, or it may be ashes or plaster. But here were two acres and a half of furrows, and only a hoe for cart and two hands to draw it, there being an aversion to other carts and horses, and chip dirt far away. Fellow travellers, as they rattled by, compared it aloud with the fields which they had passed, so that I came to know how I stood in the agricultural world. This was one field not in Mr. Coleman's report. And by the way, who estimates the value of the crop which nature yields in the still wilder fields unimproved by man? The crop of English hay is carefully weighed, the moisture calculated, the silicates and the potash, but in all dells and pond holes in the woods and pastures and swamps grows a rich and various crop only unreaped by man. Mine was, as it were, the connecting link between wild and cultivated fields. As some states are civilized and others half-civilized and others savage or barbarous, so my field was, though not in a bad sense, a half-cultivated field. They were beans, cheerfully returning to their wild and primitive state that I cultivated, and my hoe played the rangs de vache for them. Near at hand, upon the topmost spray of a birch, sings the brown thrasher, or red mavis, as some love to call him, all the morning glad of your society, that would find out another farmer's field if yours were not here. While you are planting the seed, he cries, Drop it! Drop it! Cover it up! Cover it up! Pull it up! Pull it up! Pull it up! But this was not corn, and so it was safe from such enemies as he. You may wonder what his rigmarole, his amateur Paganini performances on one string or on twenty, have to do with your planting, and yet prefer it to leached ashes or plaster. It was a cheap sort of top dressing in which I had entire faith. As I drew a still fresher soil about the rose with my hoe, I disturbed the ashes of unchronicled nations who in primeval years lived under these heavens, and their small implements of war and hunting were brought to the light of this modern day. They lay mingled with other natural stones, some of which bore the marks of having been burned by Indian fires, and some by the sun, and also bits of pottery and glass brought hither by the recent cultivators of the soil. When my hoe tinkled against the stones, that music echoed to the woods in the sky, and was an accompaniment to my labor, which yielded an instant and immeasurable crop. It was no longer beans that I hoed, nor I that hoed beans, and I remembered with as much pity as pride, if I remembered at all, my acquaintances who had gone to the city to attend the oratorios. The night hawk circled overhead in the sunny afternoons, for I sometimes made a day of it, like a moat in the eye, or in heaven's eye, falling from time to time with a swoop and a sound as if the heavens were rent, torn at last to very rags and tatters, and yet a seamless cope remained. Small imps that fill the air and lay their eggs on the ground on bare sand or rocks on the tops of hills, where few have found them, graceful and slender like ripples caught up from the pond, as leaves are raised by the wind to float in the heavens. Such kindredship is in nature. The hawk is aerial brother of the wave which he sails over and surveys. Those his perfect air-inflated wings answering to the elemental unfledged pinions of the sea. Or sometimes I watched a pair of hen-hawks circling high in the sky, 
alternately soaring and descending, approaching and leaving one another, as if they were the embodiment of my own thoughts. Or I was attracted by the passage of wild pigeons from this wood to that, with a slight quivering winnowing sound and carrier haste, or from under a rotten stump my hoe turned up a sluggish portentous and outlandish spotted salamander, a trace of Egypt in the Nile, yet our contemporary. When I paused to lean on my hoe, these sounds and sights I heard and saw anywhere in the row, a part of the inexhaustible entertainment which the country offers. On gala days the town fires its great guns, which echo like pop-guns to these woods, and some waifs of martial music occasionally penetrate thus far. To me, away there in my bean-field at the other end of the town, the big guns sounded as if a puff-ball had burst, and when there was a military turnout of which I was ignorant, I have sometimes had a vague sense all the day of some sort of itching and disease in the horizon, as if some eruption would break out there soon, either scarlatina or canker rash, until at length some more favorable puff of wind, making haste over the fields and up the wayland road, brought me information of these trainers. It seemed by the distant hum as if somebody's bees had swarmed, and that the neighbors, according to Virgil's advice, by a faint tintinabulum upon the most sonorous of their domestic utensils, were endeavoring to call them down into the hive again. And when the sound died quite away, and the hum had ceased, and the most favorable breezes told no tale, I knew that they had got the last drone of them all safely into the Middlesex hive, and that now their minds were bent on the honey with which it was smeared. I felt proud to know that the liberties of Massachusetts and of our fatherland were in such safe keeping, and as I turned to my hoeing again I was filled with an inexpressible confidence, and pursued my labor cheerfully with a calm trust in the future. When there were several bands of musicians, it sounded as if all the village was a vast bellows, and all the buildings expanded and collapsed alternately with a din. But sometimes it was a really noble and inspiring strain that reached these woods, and the trumpet that sings of fame, and I felt as if I could spit a Mexican with a good relish. For why should we always stand for trifles? and looked round for a woodchuck or a skunk to exercise my chivalry upon. These martial strains seemed as far away as Palestine, and reminded me of a march of crusaders in the horizon, with a slight tantivy and tremulous motion of the elm-tree tops which overhang the village. This was one of the great days though the sky had from my clearing only the same everlastingly great look that it wears daily, and I saw no difference in it. It was a singular experience that long acquaintance which I cultivated with beans, what with planting and hoeing and harvesting and threshing and picking over and selling them, the last was the hardest of all. I might add eating, for I did taste. I was determined to know beans. When they were growing I used to hoe from five o'clock in the morning till noon, and commonly spent the rest of the day about other affairs. Consider the intimate and curious acquaintance one makes with various kinds of weeds. It will bear some iteration in the account, for there was no little iteration in the labor, disturbing their delicate organization so ruthlessly and making such invidious distinctions with his hoe, leveling whole ranks of one species, and sedulously cultivating another. That's Roman wormwood, that's pigweed, that's sorrel, that's piper grass. Have at him! Chop him up, turn his roots upward to the sun, don't let him have a fiber in the shade. 
If you do, he'll turn himself to other side up and be as green as a leek in two days. A long war, not with cranes, but with weeds, those Trojans who had sun and rain and dews on their side. Daily the beans saw me come to their rescue, armed with a hoe, and thinned the ranks of their enemies, filled up the trenches with weedy dead. Many a lusty crest, waving Hector, that towered a whole foot above his crowding comrades, fell before my weapon and rolled in the dust. Those summer days, which some of my contemporaries devoted to the fine arts in Boston or Rome, and others to contemplation in India, and others to trade in London or New York, I thus, with the other farmers of New England, devoted to husbandry. Not that I wanted beans to eat, for I am by nature a Pythagorean, so far as beans are concerned, whether they mean porridge or voting, and exchange them for rice. But perchance, as some must work in fields, if only for the sake of tropes and expression, to serve a parable-maker one day, it was on the whole a rare amusement which, continued too long, might have become a dissipation. Though I gave them no manure, and did not hoe them all at once, I hoed them unusually well as far as I went, and was paid for it in the end. There being in truth, as Evelyn says, no compost or latation whatsoever comparable to this continual motion, repastination, and turning of the mould with the spade. The earth, he adds elsewhere, especially if fresh, has a certain magnetism in it, by which it attracts the salt, power, or virtue, call it either, which gives it life, and is the logic of all the labor and stir we keep about it to sustain us. All the dungings and other sordid temperings being but the vicar's succedaneous to this improvement. Moreover, this being one of those worn-out and exhausted lay fields which enjoy their Sabbath, had perchance as Sir Kenelm Digby thinks likely, attracted vital spirits from the air. I harvested twelve bushels of beans. But to be more particular, for it is complained that Mr. Coleman has reported chiefly the expensive experiments of gentlemen farmers, my outgoes were, for a hoe, fifty-four cents, plowing, harrowing, and furrowing, seven dollars and fifty cents, too much. Beans for seed, three dollars and twelve cents plus. Potatoes for seed, one dollar and thirty-three cents. Peas for seed, forty cents. Turnip seed, six cents. White line for crow fence, two cents. Horse cultivator and boy, three hours, one dollar. Horse and cart to get crop, seventy-five cents. In all, fourteen dollars, seventy-two cents plus. My income was patrem familius vendesum non emassum es apportet from nine bushels and twelve quarts of beans sold, sixteen dollars, ninety-four cents. Five bushels large potatoes, two dollars fifty cents. Nine bushels small potatoes, two dollars and twenty five cents. Grass, one dollar. Stocks, seventy five cents. In all, twenty three dollars forty four cents, leaving a pecuniary profit, as I have elsewhere said, of eight dollars seventy one cents plus. This is the result of my experience in raising beans. Plant the common small white bush bean about the first of June, in rows three feet by eighteen inches apart, being careful to select fresh, round, and unmixed seed. First look out for worms, and supply vacancies by planting anew. Then look out for woodchucks, if it is an exposed place, for they will nibble off the nearest tender leaves almost clean as they go 
and again when the young tendrils make their appearance they have notice of it and will shear them off with both buds and young pods sitting erect like a squirrel but above all harvest as early as possible if you would escape frosts and have a fair and saleable crop you may save much loss by this means this further experience also i gained i said to myself i will not plant beans and corn with so much industry another summer but such seeds if the seed is not lost as sincerity truth simplicity faith innocence and the like and see if they will not grow in this soil even with less toil and manurance and sustain me for surely it has not been exhausted for these crops alas I said this to myself. But now another summer is gone, and another, and another, and I am obliged to say to you, reader, that the seeds which I planted, if indeed they were the seeds of those virtues, were worm-eaten or had lost their vitality, and so did not come up. Commonly men will only be brave as their fathers were brave, or timid. This generation is very sure to plant corn and beans each new year precisely as the Indians did centuries ago, and taught the first settlers to do, as if there were a fate in it. I saw an old man the other day, to my astonishment, making the holes with a hoe for the seventieth time at least, and not for himself to lie down in. But why should not the New Englander try new adventures, and not lay so much stress on his grain, his potato and grass crop, and his orchards, raise other crops than these. Why concern ourselves so much about our beans for seed, and not be concerned at all about a new generation of men? We should really be fed and cheered if, when we met a man, we were sure to see that some of the qualities which I have named, which we all prize more than those other productions, but which are for the most part broadcast and floating in the air, had taken root and grown in him. Here comes such a subtle and ineffable quality, for instance, as truth or justice, though the slightest amount or new variety of it along the road. Our ambassadors should be instructed to send home such seeds as these, and Congress help to distribute them over all the land. We should never stand upon ceremony with sincerity. We should never cheat and insult and banish one another by our meanness, if there were present the kernel of worth and friendliness. We should not meet thus in haste. Most men I do not meet at all, for they seem not to have time. They are busy about their beans. We would not deal with a man thus plodding ever, leaning on a hoe or a spade as a staff between his work, not as a mushroom, but partially risen out of the earth, something more than erect, like swallows alighted and walking on the ground. And as he spake, his wings would now and then spread, as he meant to fly, then close again, so that we should suspect that we might be conversing with an angel. Bread may not always nourish us, but it always does us good. It even takes stiffness out of our joints, and makes us supple and buoyant, when we knew not what ailed us, to recognize any generosity in man or nature, to share any unmixed and heroic joy. Ancient poetry and mythology suggest at least that husbandry was once a sacred art, but it is pursued with irreverent haste and heedlessness by us, our object being to have large farms and large crops merely. We have no festival, no procession, no ceremony, not excepting our cattle shows and so-called thanksgivings, by which the farmer expresses a sense of the sacredness of his calling, or is reminded of its sacred origin. It is the premium and the feast which tempt him. He sacrifices not to Ceres and the terrestrial Jove, but to the infernal Plutus, rather, by avarice and selfishness and a groveling habit, 
from which none of us is free, of regarding the soil as property, or the means of acquiring property chiefly. The landscape is deformed, husbandry is degraded with us, and the farmer leads the meanest of lives. He knows nature but as a robber. Cato says that the prophets of agriculture are particularly pious or just. Maximic pius questus. And according to Vero, the old Romans, called the same earth mother and Ceres, and thought that they who cultivate it led a pious and useful life, and that they alone were left of the race of King Saturn. We are wont to forget that the sun looks on our cultivated fields and on the prairies and forests without distinction. They all reflect and absorb his rays alike, and the former make but a small part of the glorious picture which he beholds in his daily course. In his view the earth is all equally cultivated like a garden. Therefore we should receive the benefit of his light and heat with a corresponding trust and magnanimity. What though I value the seed of these beans, and harvest that in the fall of the year? This broad field which I have looked at so long looks not to me as the principal cultivator, but away from me to influences more genial to it, which water and make it green. These beans have results which are not harvested by me. Do they not grow for woodchucks, partly? The ear of wheat, in Latin spica, obsoletely speca, from spe, hope, should not be the only hope of the husbandman. Its kernel or grain, granum, from gerendo, bearing, is not all that it bears. How then can our harvest fail? Shall I not rejoice also at the abundance of the weeds, whose seeds are the granary of the birds? It matters little comparatively whether the fields fill the farmer's barns. The true husbandman will cease from anxiety, as the squirrels manifest no concern whether the woods will bear chestnuts this year or not, and finish his labor with every day relinquishing all claim to the produce of his fields, and sacrificing in his mind not only his first, but his last fruits also. End of chapter 7 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Walden. Chapter 8. The Village. After hoeing, or perhaps reading and writing, in the forenoon, I usually bathed again in the pond, swimming across one of its coves for a stint, and washed the dust of labor from my person, or smoothed out the last wrinkle which study had made, and for the afternoon was absolutely free. Every day or two I strolled to the village, to hear some of the gossip which is incessantly going on there, circulating either from mouth to mouth or from newspaper to newspaper, and which, taken in homeopathic doses, was really as refreshing in its way as the rustle of leaves and the peeping of frogs. As I walked in the woods to see the birds and squirrels, so I walked in the village to see the men and boys. Instead of the wind among the pines I heard the carts rattle. In one direction from my house there was a colony of muskrats, in the river meadows, under the grove of elms and buttonwoods. In the other horizon was a village of busy men, as curious to me as if they had been prairie dogs. Each sitting at the mouth of its burrow, or running over to a neighbor's to gossip. I went there frequently to observe their habits. The village appeared to me a great 
newsroom, and on one side, to support it, as once at Redding and Company's on State Street, they kept nuts and raisins, or salt and meal and other groceries. Some have such a vast appetite for the former commodity, that is, the news, and such sound digestive organs, that they can sit forever in public avenues without stirring, and let it simmer and whisper through them, like the Atessian winds, or as if inhaling ether, it only producing numbness and insensibility to pain, otherwise it would often be painful to bear, without affecting the consciousness. I hardly ever failed when I rambled through the village to see a row of such worthies, either sitting on a ladder, sunning themselves with their bodies inclined forward and their eyes glancing along the line this way and that from time to time with a voluptuous expression, or else leaning against a barn with their hands in their pockets, like caryatides, as if to prop it up. They, being commonly out of doors, heard whatever was in the wind. These are the coarsest mills, in which all gossip is first rudely digested or cracked up before it is emptied into finer and more delicate hoppers within doors. I observed that the vitals of the village were the grocery, the bar-room, the post-office, and the bank, and, as a necessary part of the machinery, they kept a bell, a big gun, and a fire-engine at convenient places, and the houses were so arranged as to make the most of mankind, in lanes and fronting one another so that every traveller had to run the gauntlet, and every man, woman, and child might get a lick at him. Of course those who were stationed nearest to the head of the line, where they could most see and be seen, and have the first blow at him, paid the highest prices for their places and the few straggling inhabitants in the outskirts, where long gaps in the line began to occur, and the traveller could get over walls or turn aside into cow-paths and so escape, paid a very slight ground or window tax. Signs were hung out on all sides to allure him, some to catch him by the appetite as the tavern and victualling cellar, some by the fancy as the dry goods store and the jeweller's, and others by the hair or the feet or the skirts, as the barber, the shoemaker, or the tailor. Besides, there was a still more terrible standing invitation to call at every one of these houses, and company expected about these times. For the most part I escaped wonderfully from these dangers, either by proceeding at once boldly and without deliberation to the goal, as is recommended to those who run the gauntlet, or by keeping my thoughts on high things, like Orpheus, who, loudly singing the praises of the gods to his lyre, drowned the voices of the sirens, and kept out of danger. Sometimes I bolted suddenly, and nobody could tell my whereabouts, for I did not stand much about gracefulness, and never hesitated at a gap in a fence. I was even accustomed to make an eruption into some houses, where I was well entertained, and after learning the colonel's and very last sieve full of news, what had subsided, the prospects of war and peace, and whether the world was likely to hold together much longer, I was let out through the rear avenues, and so escaped to the woods again. It was very pleasant when I stayed late in town to launch myself into the night, especially if it was dark and tempestuous and set sail for some bright village parlour or lecture-room, with a bag of rye or Indian meal upon my shoulder, for my snug harbour in the woods, having made all tight, without and withdrawn under hatches with a merry crew of thoughts, leaving only my outer man at the helm, or even tying up the helm when it was plain sailing. I had many a genial thought by the cabin fire, as I sailed. I was never cast away, nor distressed in any weather, though I encountered some severe storms. It is darker in the woods, even in common nights, than most suppose. 
I frequently had to look up at the opening between the trees above the path in order to learn my route, and, where there was no cart path, to feel with my feet the faint track which I had worn, or steer by the known relation of particular trees which I felt with my hands, passing between two pines, for instance, not more than eighteen inches apart, in the midst of the woods, invariably in the darkest night. Sometimes after coming home thus late in a dark and muggy night, when my feet felt the path which my eyes could not see, dreaming and absent-minded all the way, until I was aroused by having to raise my hand to lift the latch, I have not been able to recall a single step of my walk, and I have thought that perhaps my body would find its way home if its master should forsake it, as the hand finds its way to the mouth without assistance. Several times, when a visitor chanced to stay into evening, and it proved a dark night, I was obliged to conduct him to the cart path in the rear of the house, and then point out to him the direction he was to pursue, and in keeping which he was to be guided rather by his feet than his eyes. One very dark night I directed thus on their way two young men who had been fishing in the pond. They lived about a mile off through the woods, and were quite used to the route. A day or two after one of them told me that they wandered about the greater part of the night, close by their own premises, and did not get home till toward morning, by which time, as there had been several heavy showers in the meanwhile, and the leaves were very wet, they were drenched to their skins. I have heard of many going astray even in the village streets, when the darkness was so thick that you could cut it with a knife, as the saying is. Some who live in the outskirts, having come to town a shopping in their wagons, have been obliged to put up for the night, and gentlemen and ladies making a call have gone half a mile out of their way, feeling the sidewalk only with their feet, and not knowing when they turned. It is a surprising and memorable as well as valuable experience to be lost in the woods any time. Often in a snowstorm, even by day, one will come out upon a well-known road and yet find it impossible to tell which way leads to the village. Though he knows that he has traveled it a thousand times, he cannot recognize a feature in it but it is as strange to him as if it were a road in Siberia. By night, of course, the perplexity is infinitely greater. In our most trivial walks we are constantly, though unconsciously, steering like pilots by certain well-known beacons and headlands. And if we go beyond our usual course we still carry in our minds the bearing of some neighboring cape, and not till we are completely lost or turned around for a man needs only to be turned round once with his eyes shut in this world to be lost, do we appreciate the vastness and strangeness of nature. Every man has to learn the points of compass again as often as be awakes, whether from sleep or any abstraction, not till we are lost, in other words, not till we have lost the world do we begin to find ourselves and realize where we are and the infinite extent of our relations. One afternoon near the end of the first summer when I went to the village to get a shoe from the cobblers, I was seized and put into jail, because, as I have elsewhere related, I did not pay a tax to, or recognize the authority of, the state which buys and sells men, women, and children like cattle at the door of its senate house. I had gone down to the woods for other purposes. But wherever a man goes, men will pursue and paw him with their dirty institutions, and if they can, constrain him to belong to their desperate odd-fellow society. It is true. I might have resisted forcibly with more or less effect, might have run amok against society, but I preferred that society should run amok against me, it being the desperate party. However, I was released the next day, obtained my mended shoe, and returned to the woods. 
in season to get my dinner of huckleberries on Fairhaven Hill. I was never molested by any person but those who represented the state. I had no lock nor bolt but for the desk which held my papers, not even a nail to put over my latch or windows. I never fastened my door night or day, though I was to be absent several days, not even when the next fall I spent a fortnight in the woods of Maine. And yet my house was more respected than if it had been surrounded by a file of soldiers. The tired rambler could rest and warm himself by my fire. The literary amuse himself with a few books on my table, or the curious, by opening my closet door, see what was left of my dinner and what prospect I had of supper. Yet though many people of every class came this way to the pond, I suffered no serious inconvenience from these sources, and I never missed anything but one small book, a volume of Homer, which perhaps was improperly gilded, and this I trust a soldier of our camp has found by this time. I am convinced that if all men were to live as simply as I then did, thieving and robbery would be unknown. These take place only in communities where some have got more than is sufficient, while others have not enough. The Pope's homers would soon get properly distributed. Nec bella feront faginus astabat dom scyphus ante dapus. Nor wars did men molest, when only beechen bowls were in request. You who govern public affairs, what need have you to employ punishments? Love virtue, and the people will be virtuous. The virtues of a superior man are like the wind. The virtues of a common man are like the grass. I, the grass, when the wind passes over it, bends. End of chapter 8 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Chapter 9 The Pawns. Sometimes, having a surfeit of human society and gossip, and worn out all my village friends. I rambled still farther westward than I habitually dwell, into yet more unfrequented parts of the town, to fresh woods and pastures new, or while the sun was setting made my supper of huckleberries and blueberries on Fair Haven Hill, and laid up a store for several days. The fruits do not yield their true flavor to the purchaser of them, nor to him who raises them for the market. There is but one way to obtain it, yet few take that way. If you would know the flavor of huckleberries, ask the cowboy or the partridge. It is a vulgar error to suppose that you have tasted huckleberries who never plucked them. A huckleberry never reaches Boston, they have not been known there since they grew on her three hills. The ambrosial and essential part of the fruit is lost, with the bloom which is rubbed off in the market cart, or they become mere provender. As long as eternal justice reigns, not one innocent huckleberry can be transported thither from the country's hills. Occasionally, after my hoeing was done for the day, I joined some impatient companion who had been fishing on the pond since morning, as silent and motionless as a duck or a floating leaf, and after practicing various kinds of philosophy, had concluded commonly by the time I arrived that he belonged to the ancient sect 
of Cenobites. There was one older man, an excellent fisher and skilled in all kinds of woodcraft, who was pleased to look upon my house as a building erected for the convenience of fishermen, and I was equally pleased when he sat in my doorway to arrange his lines. He at one end of the boat and I at the other, but not many words passed between us, for he had grown deaf in his later years, but he occasionally hummed a psalm, which harmonized well enough with my philosophy. Our intercourse was thus altogether one of unbroken harmony, far more pleasing to remember than if it had been carried on by speech. When, as was commonly the case, I had none to commune with, I used to raise the echoes by striking with a paddle on the side of my boat, filling the surrounding woods with circling and dilating sounds, stirring them up as the keeper of a menagerie his wild beasts, until I elicited a growl from every wooded vale and hillside. In warm evenings I frequently sat in the boat playing the flute, and saw the perch which I seemed to have charmed hovering around me, and the moon travelling over the ribbed bottom which was strewed with the wrecks of the forest. Formerly I had come to this pond adventurously from time to time, in dark summer nights, with a companion, and making a fire close to the water's edge, which we thought attracted the fishes, we caught pouts with a bunch of worms strung on a thread, and when we had done far in the night, threw the burning brands high into the air like sky rockets, which, coming down into the pond, were quenched with a loud hissing, and we were suddenly groping in total darkness. Through this whistling a tune, we took our way to the haunts of men again, but now I had made my home by the shore. Sometimes, after staying in a village parlor till the family had all retired, I have returned to the woods and partly with a view to the next day's dinner, spent the hours of midnight fishing from a boat by moonlight, serenaded by owls and foxes, and hearing from time to time the creaking note of some unknown bird close at hand. These experiences were very memorable and valuable to me. Anchored in forty feet of water, and twenty or thirty rods from the shore, surrounded sometimes by thousands of small perch and shiners, dimpling the surface with their tails in the moonlight, and communicating by a long flaxen line with mysterious nocturnal fishes which had their dwelling forty feet below, or sometimes dragging sixty feet of line about the pond as I drifted in the gentle night breeze, now and then feeling a slight vibration along it, indicative of some life prowling about its extremity, of dull, uncertain, blundering purpose there, and slow to make up its mind. At length you slowly raise, pulling hand over hand, some horned pout, squeaking and squirming to the upper air. It was very queer, especially in dark nights when your thoughts had wandered to vast and cosmogonal themes in other spheres, to feel this faint jerk which came to interrupt your dreams and link you to nature again. It seemed as if I might next cast my line upward into the air, as well as downward into this element, which was scarcely more dense. Thus I caught two fishes, as it were, with one hook. The scenery of Walden is on a humble scale, and, though very beautiful, does not approach to grandeur, nor can it much concern one who has not long frequented it, or lived by its shore. Yet this pond is so remarkable for its depth and purity as to merit a particular description. It is a clear and deep 
green well, half a mile long and a mile and three quarters in circumference, and contains about sixty-one and a half acres, a perennial spring in the midst of pine and oak woods, without any visible inlet or outlet, except by the clouds and evaporation. The surrounding hills rise abruptly from the water to the height of forty to eighty feet, though on the southeast and east they attain to about one hundred and one hundred and fifty feet respectively, within a quarter and a third of a mile. They are exclusively woodland. All our Concord waters have two colors at least, one when viewed at a distance, and another more proper close at hand. The first depends more on the light, and follows the sky. In clear weather in summer, they appear blue at a little distance, especially if agitated, and at a great distance all appear alike. In stormy weather they are sometimes a, a dark slate color. The sea, however, is said to be blue one day and green another without any perceptible change in the atmosphere. I have seen our river when, the landscape being covered with snow, both water and ice were almost as green as grass. Some consider blue to be the color of pure water, whether liquid or solid. But looking directly down into our waters from a boat, they are seen to be of very different colors. Walden is blue at one time and green at another, even from the same point of view. Lying between the earth and the heavens, it partakes of the color of both. Viewed from a hilltop it reflects the color of the sky, but near at hand it is of a yellowish tint, next the shore where you can see the sand, then a light green, which gradually deepens to a uniform dark green in the body of the pond. In some lights, viewed even from a hilltop, it is of a vivid green next to the shore. Some have referred this to the reflection of the verdure, but it is equally green there against the railroad sandbank, and in the spring before the leaves are expanded, and it may be simply the result of the prevailing blue mixed with the yellow of the sand. Such is the color of its iris. This is that portion also, where in the spring, the ice being warmed by the heat of the sun, reflected from the bottom, and also transmitted through the earth, melts first and forms a narrow canal about the still frozen middle. Like the rest of our waters, when much agitated, in clear weather, so that the surface of the waves may reflect the sky at the right angle, or because there is more light mixed with it, it appears at a little distance of a darker blue than the sky itself. And at such a time, being on its surface, and looking with divided vision, so as to see the reflection, I have discerned a matchless and indescribable light blue, such as watered or changeable silks and sword blades suggest more cerulean than the sky itself, alternating with the original dark green on the opposite sides of the waves, which last appeared but muddy in comparison. It is a vitreous greenish blue, as I remember it, like those patches of the winter sky seen through cloud vistas in the west before sundown. Yet a single glass of its water held up to the light is as colorless as an equal quantity of air. It is well known that a large plate of glass will have a green tint, owing, as the makers say, to its body. But a small piece of the same will be colorless. How large a body of Walden water would be required to reflect a green tint, I have never proved. The water of our river is black, or a very dark brown to one looking directly down on it, 
and like that of most ponds imparts to the body of one bathing in it a yellowish tinge. But this water is of such crystalline purity that the body of the bather appears of an alabaster whiteness, still more unnatural, which, as the limbs are magnified and distorted withal, produces a monstrous effect, making fit studies for a Michelangelo. The water is so transparent that the bottom can easily be discerned at the depth of twenty-five or thirty feet. Paddling over it, you may see, many feet beneath the surface, the schools of perch and shiners, perhaps only an inch long, yet the former easily distinguished by their transverse bars, and you think that they must be ascetic fish that find a subsistence there. Once in the winter, many years ago, when I had been cutting holes through the ice in order to catch pickerel, as I stepped ashore I tossed my axe back on to the ice, but, as if some evil genius had directed it, it slid four or five rods directly into one of the holes, where the water was twenty-five feet deep. Out of curiosity I laid down on the ice, and looked through the hole, until I saw the axe a little on one side standing on its head, with its helve erect and gently swaying to and fro with the pulse of the pond. And there it might have stood erect and swaying till in the course of time the handle rotted off, if I had not disturbed it. Making another hole directly over it, with an ice chisel which I had, and cutting down the longest birch which I could find in the neighborhood with my knife, I made a slip-noose which I attached to its end, and letting it down carefully, passed it over the knob of the handle and drew it by a line along the birch, and so pulled the axe out again. The shore is composed of a belt of smooth, rounded white stones, like paving stones, except one or two short sand beaches, and is so steep that in many places a single leap will carry you into water over your head. And were it not for its remarkable transparency, that would be the last to be seen of its bottom till it rose on the opposite side. Some think it is bottomless. It is nowhere muddy, and a casual observer would say that there were no weeds at all in it, and of noticeable plants, except in the little meadows recently overflowed, which do not properly belong to it, a closer scrutiny does not detect a flag, nor a bulrush, nor even a lily, yellow or white, but only a few small heart-leaves and potomogetons, and perhaps a water-target or two, all which, however, a bather might not perceive, and these plants are clean and bright like the element they grow in. The stones extend a rod or two into the water, and then the bottom is pure sand, except in the deepest part, where there is usually a little sediment, probably from the decay of the leaves which have been wafted on to it, so many successive falls, and a bright green weed is brought up on anchors even in midwinter. We have one other pond just like this, White Pond, in Nine Acre Corner, about two and a half miles westerly. But, though I am acquainted with most of the ponds within a dozen miles of this center, I do not know a third of this pure and well-like character. Successive nations perchance have drank at, admired, and fathomed it, and passed away, and still its water is green and pellucid as ever. Not an intermitting spring. Perhaps on that spring morning when Adam and Eve were driven out of Eden, Walden Pond was already in existence, and even then breaking up in a gentle spring rain accompanied with mist and a southerly wind, and covered with myriads of ducks and geese which had not heard of the fall, when still such pure lakes sufficed them. Even then it had commenced to rise and fall, and had clarified its waters, and colored them of the hue they now wear, 
and obtained a patent of heaven to be the only Walden pond in the world and distiller of celestial dews. Who knows in how many unremembered nations' literatures this has been the Castalian fountain, or what nymphs presided over it in the Golden Age? It is a gem of the first water which Concord wears in her coronet. Yet, perchance, the first who came to this well have left some trace of their footsteps. I have been surprised to detect, encircling the pond, even where a thick wood has just been cut down on the shore, a narrow shelf-like path in the steep hillside, alternately rising and falling, approaching and receding from the water's edge, as old probably as the race of man here, worn by the feet of aboriginal hunters, and still from time to time unwittingly trodden by the present occupants of the land. This is particularly distinct to one standing on the middle of the pond in winter, just after a light snow has fallen, appearing as a clear, undulating white line, unobscured by weeds and twigs, and very obvious a quarter of a mile off in many places where in summer it is hardly distinguishable close at hand. The snow reprints it, as it were, in clear white type, alto relievo. The ornamented grounds of villas which will one day be built here may still preserve some trace of this. The pond rises and falls, but whether regularly or not, and within what period nobody knows, though as usual many pretend to know. It is commonly higher in winter and lower in the summer, though not corresponding to the general wet and dryness. I can remember when it was a foot or two lower, and also when it was at least five feet higher than when I lived by it. There is a narrow sandbar running into it, with very deep water on one side, on which I helped boil a kettle of chowder, some six rods from the main shore, about the year 1824, which it has not been possible to do for twenty-five years. And, on the other hand, my friends used to listen with incredulity when I told them that a few years later I was accustomed to fish from a boat in a secluded cove in the woods, fifteen rods from the only shore they knew, which place was long since converted into a meadow. But the pond has risen steadily for two years, and now, in the summer of fifty-two, is just five feet higher than when I lived there, or as high as it was thirty years ago, and fishing goes on again in the meadow. This makes a difference of level, at the outside, of six or seven feet, and yet the water shed by the surrounding hills is insignificant in amount, and this overflow must be referred to causes which affect the deep springs. This same summer the pond has begun to fall again, it is remarkable that this fluctuation, whether periodical or not, appears thus to require many years for its accomplishment. I have observed one rise and a part of two falls, and I expect that a dozen or fifteen years hence the water will again be as low as I have ever known it. Flint's Pond, a mile eastward, allowing for the disturbance occasioned by its inlets and outlets, and the smaller intermediate ponds also, sympathize with Walden, and recently attained their greatest height at the same time with the latter. The same is true as far as my observation goes of White Pond. This rise and fall of Walden at long intervals serves this use at least, the water standing at this great height for a year or more though it makes it difficult to walk around it, kills the shrubs and trees which have sprung up about its edge since the last rise. Pitch pines, birches, alders, 
aspens, and others, and falling again leaves an unobstructed shore, for unlike many ponds, and all waters which are subject to a daily tide, its shore is cleanest when the water is lowest. On the side of the pond, next my house, a row of pitch pines fifteen feet high has been killed and tipped over as if by a lever, and thus a stop put to their encroachments, and their size indicates how many years have elapsed since the last rise to this height. By this fluctuation the pond asserts its title to a shore, and thus the shore is shorn, and the trees cannot hold it by right of possession. These are the lips of the lake, on which no beard grows. It licks its chaps from time to time. When the weather is at its height, the alders, willows, and maples send forth a mass of fibrous red roots, several feet long from all sides of their stems in the water, and to the height of three or four feet from the ground, in the effort to maintain themselves. And I have known the high blueberry bushes about the shore, which commonly produce no fruit, bear an abundant crop under these circumstances. Some have been puzzled to tell how the shore became so regularly paved. My townsmen have all heard the tradition. The oldest people tell me that they heard it in their youth, that anciently the Indians were holding a powwow upon a hill here, which rose as high into the heavens as the pond now sinks deep into the earth. And they used much profanity, as the story goes, though this vice is one of which the Indians were never guilty, and while they were thus engaged the hill shook and suddenly sank, and only one old squaw named Walden escaped, and from her the pond was named. It has been conjectured that when the hill shook these stones rolled down its side and became the present shore. It is very certain, at any rate, that once there was no pond here, and now there is one, and this Indian fable does not in any respect conflict with the account of the ancient settler whom I have mentioned, who remembers so well when he first came here with his divining rod, saw a thin vapor rising from the sward, and the hazel pointed steadily downward, and he concluded to dig a well here. As for the stones, Many still think that they are hardly to be accounted for by the action of the waves on these hills. But I observe that the surrounding hills are remarkably full of the same kind of stones, so that they have been obliged to pile them up in walls on both sides of the railroad cut nearest the pond. And moreover, there are more stones where the shore is most abrupt, so that, unfortunately, it is no longer a mystery to me. I detect the paver. If the name was not derived from that of some English locality, Saffron Walden, for instance, one might suppose that it was called originally Walled In Pond. The pond was my well, ready dug. For four months in the year its water is as cold as it is pure at all times, and I think that it is then as good as any if not the best in the town. In the winter all water which is exposed to the air is colder than springs and wells which are protected from it. The temperature of the pond water, which had stood in the room where I sat from five o'clock in the afternoon till noon the next day, the 6th of March, 1846, the thermometer having been up to sixty-five or seventy degrees some of the time, owing partly to the sun on the roof, was forty-two degrees, or one degree colder than the water of one of the coldest wells in the village just drawn. The temperature of the boiling spring the same day was forty-five degrees, or the warmest of any water tried, though it is the coldest that I know of in summer, 
when beside shallow and stagnant surface water is not mingled with it. Moreover, in summer Walden never becomes so warm as most water which is exposed to the sun on account of its depth. In the warmest weather I usually placed a pailful in my cellar where it became cool in the night and remained so during the day, though I also resorted to a spring in the neighborhood. It was as good when a week old as the day it was dipped and had no taste of the pump. Whoever camps for a week in summer by the shore of a pond needs only bury a pail of water a few feet deep in the shade of his camp to be independent of the luxury of ice. There have been caught in Walden pickerel, one weighing seven pounds, to say nothing of another which carried off a reel with great velocity, which the fisherman safely set down at eight pounds because he did not see him. Perch and pouts, some of each weighing over two pounds, shiners, chivins or roach, a very few breams, and a couple of eels, one weighing four pounds. I am thus particular because the weight of a fish is commonly its only title to fame, and these are the only eels I have heard of here. Also, I have a faint recollection of a little fish some five inches long, with silvery sides and a greenish back, somewhat dace-like in its character, which I mention here chiefly to link my facts to fable. Nevertheless, this pond is not very fertile in fish. Its pickerel, though not abundant, are its chief boast. I have seen at one time, lying on the ice, pickerel of at least three different kinds. A long and shallow one, steel-colored, most like those caught in the river. A bright golden kind, with greenish reflections and remarkably deep, which is the most common here and another golden-colored, and shaped like the last, but peppered on the sides with small dark brown or black spots, intermixed with a few faint blood-red ones, very much like a trout. The specific name, reticulatus, would not apply to this. It should be guttatus, rather. These are all very firm fish, and weigh more than their size promises. The shiners, pouts, and perch also, and indeed all the fishes which inhabit this pond, are much cleaner, handsomer, and firmer fleshed than those in the river, and most other ponds, as the water is purer, and they can easily be distinguished from them. Probably many ichthyologists would make new varieties of some of them. There are also a certain race of frogs and tortoises, and a few mussels in it. Muskrats and mink leave their traces about it, and occasionally a traveling mud turtle visits it. Sometimes, when I pushed off my boat in the morning, I disturbed a great mud turtle which had secreted himself under the boat in the night. Ducks and geese frequent it in the spring and fall. The white-bellied swallows, hirundo bicolor, skim over it, and the peatweets, totanus macularius, teeter along its stony shores all summer. I have sometimes disturbed a fish-hawk sitting on a white pine over the water, but I doubt if it is ever profaned by the wind of a gull, like Fair Haven. At most it tolerates one annual loon. These are all the animals of consequence which frequent it now. You may see from a boat, in calm weather, near the sandy eastern shore, where the water is eight or ten feet deep, and also in some other parts of the pond, some circular heaps half a dozen feet in diameter, by a foot in height, consisting of small stones less than a hen's egg in size, where all around is bare sand. At first you wonder if the Indians could have formed them on the ice for any purpose, 
and so when the ice melted they sank to the bottom. But they are too regular, and some of them plainly too fresh for that. They are similar to those found in rivers, but as there are no suckers nor lampreys here, I know not by what fish they could be made. Perhaps they are the nests of the chivin. These lend a pleasing mystery to the bottom. The shore is irregular enough not to be monotonous. I have in my mind's eye the western, indented with deep bays, the bolder northern, and the beautifully scalloped southern shore, where successive capes overlap each other and suggest unexplored coves between. The forest was never so good a setting, nor is so distinctly beautiful, as when seen from the middle of a small lake, amid hills which rise from the water's edge. For the water in which it is reflected not only makes the best foreground in such a case, but with its winding shore the most natural and agreeable boundary to it. There is no rawness nor imperfection in its edge there, as where the axe has cleared a part, or a cultivated field abuts on it. The trees have ample room to expand on the waterside, and each sends forth its most vigorous branch in that direction. There nature has woven a natural selvage, and the eye rises by just gradations from the low shrubs of the shore to the highest trees. There are few traces of man's hand to be seen. The water laves the shore as it did a thousand years ago. A lake is the landscape's most beautiful and expressive feature. It is earth's eye, looking into which the beholder measures the depth of his own nature. The fluviatile trees next the shore are the slender eyelashes which fringe it, and the wooded hills and cliffs around it are its overhanging brows. Standing on the smooth sandy beach at the east end of the pond, in a calm September afternoon, when a slight haze makes the opposite shoreline indistinct, I have seen whence came the expression, the glassy surface of a lake. When you invert your head, it looks like a thread of finest gossamer stretched across the valley, and gleaming against the distant pine woods, separating one stratum of the atmosphere from another. You would think that you could walk dry under it to the opposing hills, and that the swallows which skim over might perch on it. Indeed, they sometimes dive below this line as if it were by mistake, and are undeceived. As you look over the pond westward, you are obliged to employ both your hands to defend your eyes against the reflected as well as the true sun, for they are equally bright. And if between the two you survey its surface critically, it is literally as smooth as glass, except where the skater insects at equal intervals scatter over its whole extent by their motions in the sun, produce the finest imaginable sparkle on it. Or, perchance, a duck plumes itself. Or, as I have said, a swallow skims so low as to touch it. It may be that in the distance a fish describes an arc of three or four feet in the air, and there is one bright flash where it emerges and another where it strikes the water. Sometimes the whole silvery arc is revealed, or here and there, perhaps, is a thistle-down floating on its surface, which the fishes dart at, and so dimple it again. It is like molten glass, cooled but not congealed, 
and the few motes in it are pure and beautiful like the imperfections in glass. You may often detect a yet smoother and darker water, separated from the rest as if by an invisible cobweb, boom of the water nymphs resting on it. From a hilltop you can see a fish leap in almost any part, for not a pickerel or shiner picks an insect from this smooth surface, but it manifestly disturbs the equilibrium of the whole lake. It is wonderful with what elaborateness this simple fact is advertised. This piscine murder will out, and from my distant perch I distinguish the circling undulations when they are half a dozen rods in diameter. You can even detect a water-bug, Gyranus, ceaselessly progressing over the smooth surface a quarter of a mile off, for they furrow the water slightly, making a conspicuous ripple bounded by two diverging lines. But the skaters glide over it without rippling it perceptibly. When the surface is considerably agitated, there are no skaters nor water-bugs on it, but apparently, in calm days, they leave their havens and adventurously glide forth from the shore by short impulses till they completely cover it. It is a soothing employment on one of those fine days in the fall, when all the warmth of the sun is fully appreciated, to sit on a stump on such a height as this, overlooking the pond, and study the dimpling circles which are incessantly inscribed on its otherwise invisible surface amid the reflected skies and trees. Over this great expanse there is no disturbance, but it is thus at once gently smoothed away and assuaged, as, when a vase of water is jarred, the trembling circles seek the shore and all is smooth again. Not a fish can leap or an insect fall on the pond, but it is thus reported in circling dimples, in lines of beauty, as it were the constant welling up of its fountain, the gentle pulsing of its life, the heaving of its breast. The thrills of joy and thrills of pain are indistinguishable. How peaceful the phenomena of the lake. Again the works of man shine as in the spring. Ay, every leaf and twig and stone and cobweb sparkles now at mid-afternoon, as when covered with dew in a spring morning. Every motion of an oar or an insect produces a flash of light and if an oar falls, how sweet the echo. In such a day, in September or October, Walden is a perfect forest mirror, set round with stones as precious to my eye as if fewer or rarer. Nothing so fair, so pure, and at the same time so large as a lake, perchance, lies on the surface of the earth. Sky water. It needs no fence. Nations come and go without defiling it. It is a mirror which no stone can crack, whose quick silver will never wear off whose gilding nature continually repairs. No storms, no dust, can dim its surface ever fresh. A mirror in which all impurity presented to it sinks, swept and dusted by the sun's hazy brush. This the light dust-cloth, 
which retains no breath that is breathed on it, but sends its own to float as clouds high above its surface and be reflected in its bosom still. A field of water betrays the spirit that is in the air. It is continually receiving new life and motion from above. It is intermediate in its nature between land and sky. On land only the grass and trees wave, but the water itself is rippled by the wind. I see where the breeze dashes across it by the streaks or flakes of light. It is remarkable that we can look down on its surface. We shall perhaps look down thus on the surface of air at length, and mark where a still subtler spirit sweeps over it. The skaters and water bugs finally disappear in the latter part of October, when the severe frosts have come. And then, and in November, usually in a calm day, there is absolutely nothing to ripple the surface. One November afternoon, in the calm at the end of a rainstorm of several days' duration, when the sky was still completely overcast and the air was full of mist, I observed that the pond was remarkably smooth, so that it was difficult to distinguish its surface, though it no longer reflected the bright tints of October, but the somber November colors of the surrounding hills. Though I passed over it as gently as possible, the slight undulations produced by my boat extended almost as far as I could see, and gave a ribbed appearance to the reflections. But, as I was looking over the surface, I saw here and there at a distance a faint glimmer, as if some skater insects which had escaped the frosts might be collected there, or, perchance, the surface being so smoothed, betrayed where a spring welled up from the bottom. Paddling gently to one of these places, I was surprised to find myself surrounded by myriads of small perch, about five inches long, of a rich bronze color in the green water, sporting there and constantly rising to the surface and dimpling it, sometimes leaving bubbles on it. In such transparent and seemingly bottomless water, reflecting the clouds, I seem to be floating through the air as in a balloon, and their swimming impressed me as a kind of flight, or hovering, as if they were a compact flock of birds passing just beneath my level on the right or left their fins like sails set all around them. There were many such schools in the pond, apparently improving the short season before winter would draw an icy shutter over their broad skylight, sometimes giving to the surface an appearance as if a slight breeze struck it, or a few raindrops fell there. When I approached carelessly and alarmed them, they made a sudden splash and rippling with their tails, as if one had struck the water with a bushy bow, and instantly took refuge in the depths. At length the wind rose, the mist increased, and the waves began to run, and the perch leaped much higher than before, half out of water a hundred black points, three inches long, at once above the surface. Even as late as the fifth of December one year, I saw some dimples on the surface, and thinking it was going to rain hard immediately, the air being full of mist, I made haste to take my place at the oars and row homeward. 
Already the rain seemed rapidly increasing, though I felt none on my cheek, and I anticipated a thorough soaking. But suddenly the dimples ceased, for they were produced by the perch, which the noise of my oars had seared into the depths, and I saw their schools dimly disappearing. So I spent a dry afternoon, after all. An old man who used to frequent this pond nearly sixty years ago, when it was dark with surrounding forests, tells me that in those days he sometimes saw it all alive with ducks and other waterfowl, and that there were many eagles about it. He came here a-fishing, and used an old log canoe which he found on the shore. It was made of two white pine logs dug out and pinned together, and was cut off square at the ends. It was very clumsy, but lasted a great many years before it became waterlogged and perhaps sank to the bottom. He did not know whose it was. It belonged to the pond. He used to make a cable for his anchor of strips of hickory bark tied together. An old man, a potter, who lived by the pond before the Revolution, told him once that there was an iron chest at the bottom, and that he had seen it. Sometimes it would come floating up to the shore, but when you went toward it, it would go back into the deep water and disappear. I was pleased to hear of the old log canoe, which took the place of an Indian one of the same material, but more graceful construction, which perchance had first been a tree on the bank, and then, as it were, fell into the water, to float there for a generation, the most proper vessel for the lake. I remember that when I first looked into these depths, there were many large trunks to be seen indistinctly lying on the bottom, which had either been blown over formerly, or left on the ice at the last cutting, when wood was cheaper, but now they have mostly disappeared. When I first paddled a boat on Walden, it was completely surrounded by thick and lofty pine and oak woods, and in some of its coves grapevines had run over the trees next the water, and formed bowers under which a boat could pass. The hills which form its shores are so steep, and the woods on them then so high, that as you look down from the west end, it had the appearance of an amphitheatre for some land of sylvan spectacle. I have spent many an hour, when I was younger, floating over its surface as the zephyr willed, having paddled my boat to the middle, and lying on my back across the seats in a summer forenoon, dreaming awake, until I was aroused by the boat touching the sand and I arose to see what shore my fates had impelled me to. Days when idleness was the most attractive and productive industry. Many a forenoon have I stolen away, preferring to spend thus the most valued part of the day. For I was rich, if not in money, in sunny hours and summer days and spent them lavishly. Nor do I regret that I did not waste more of them in the workshop or the teacher's desk. But since I left those shores, the wood choppers have still further laid them waste, and now for many a year there will be no more rambling through the aisles of the wood, with occasional vistas through which you see the water. My muse may be excused if she is silent henceforth. How can you expect the birds to sing when their groves are cut down? Now the trunks of trees on the bottom, and the old log canoe, and the dark surrounding woods are gone, and the villagers, who scarcely know where it lies, Instead of going to the pond to bathe or drink, 
are thinking to bring its water, which should be as sacred as the Ganges at least, to the village in a pipe, to wash their dishes with, to earn their Walden by the turning of a cock or the drawing of a plug. That devilish iron horse, whose ear-rending neigh is heard throughout the town, has muddied the boiling spring with his foot, and he it is that has browsed off all the woods on Walden shore, that Trojan horse, with a thousand men in his belly, introduced by mercenary Greeks. Where is the country's champion, the moor of Moor Hill, to meet him at the deep cut, and thrust an avenging lance between the ribs of the bloated pest. Nevertheless, of all the characters I have known, perhaps Walden wears best, and best preserves its purity. Many men have been likened to it, but few deserve that honor. Though the woodchoppers have laid bare first this shore and then that, and the Irish have built their sties by it, and the railroad has infringed on its border, and the ice men have skimmed it once, it is itself unchanged. The same water which my youthful eyes fell on, all the change is in me. It has not acquired one permanent wrinkle after all its ripples. It is perennially young, and I may stand and see a swallow dip, apparently to pick an insect from its surface as of yore. It struck me again tonight, as if I had not seen it almost daily for more than twenty years. Why, here is Walden, the same woodland lake that I discovered so many years ago, where a forest was cut down last winter. Another is springing up by its shore as lustily as ever. The same thought is welling up to its surface that was then. It is the same liquid joy and happiness to itself and its maker. Aye, and it may be to me. It is the work of a brave man, surely, in whom there was no guile. He rounded this water with his hand, deepened and clarified it in his thought, and in his will bequeathed it to concord. I see by its face that it is visited by the same reflection, and I can almost say, Walden, is it you? It is no dream of mine to ornament a line. I cannot come nearer to God and heaven than I live to Walden even. I am its stony shore, and the breeze that passes o'er, and the hollow of my hand are its water and its sand, and its deepest resort lies high in my thought. The cars never pause to look at it, yet I fancy that the engineers and firemen and brakemen and those passengers who have a season ticket and see it often are better men for the sight. The engineer does not forget at night, or his nature does not, that he has held this vision of serenity and purity once at least during the day. Though seen but once, it helps to wash out State Street and the engine's soot. One proposes that it be called God's Drop. I have said that Walden has no visible inlet nor outlet, 
but it is on the one hand distantly and indirectly related to Flint's Pond, which is more elevated, by a chain of small ponds coming from that quarter, and on the other directly and manifestly to Concord River, which is lower, by a similar chain of ponds, through which in some other geological period it may have flowed, and by a little digging, which, God forbid, it can be made to flow thither again. If by living thus reserved and austere, like a hermit in the woods, so long it has acquired such wonderful purity, who would not regret that the comparatively impure waters of Flint's Pond should be mingled with it, or itself should ever go to waste its sweetness in the ocean's wave. Flint's or Sandy Pond, in Lincoln, our greatest lake and inland sea, lies about a mile east of Walden. It is much larger, being said to contain 197 acres, and is more fertile in fish but it is comparatively shallow and not remarkably pure. A walk through the woods thither was often my recreation. It was worth the while, if only to feel the wind blow on your cheeks freely, and see the waves run, and remember the life of mariners. I went a chestnutting there in the fall on windy days, when the nuts were dropping into the water, and were washed to my feet and one day as I crept along its sedgy shore, the fresh spray blowing in my face, I came upon the moldering wreck of a boat, the sides gone, and hardly more than the impression of its flat bottom left amid the rushes, yet its model was sharply defined, as if it were a large decayed pad with its veins. It was as impressive a wreck as one could imagine on the seashore, and had as good a moral. It is by this time mere vegetable mold and undistinguishable pond shore, through which rushes and flags have pushed up. I used to admire the ripple marks on the sandy bottom, at the north end of this pond, made firm and hard to the feet of the wader by the pressure of the water, and the rushes which grew in Indian file, in waving lines, corresponding to these marks, rank behind rank, as if the waves had planted them. There also I have found, in considerable quantities, curious balls, composed apparently of fine grass or roots, of pipewort perhaps, from half an inch to four inches in diameter, and perfectly spherical. They wash back and forth in shallow water on a sandy bottom, and are sometimes cast on the shore. They are either solid grass, or have a little sand in the middle. At first you would say that they were formed by the action of the waves, like a pebble. Yet the smallest are made of equally coarse materials, half an inch long, and they are produced only at one season of the year. Moreover, the waves, I suspect, do not so much construct as wear down a material which has already acquired consistency. They preserve their form when dry for an indefinite period. Flint's Pond Such is the poverty of our nomenclature. What right had the unclean and stupid farmer whose farm abutted on this sky-water? whose shores he has ruthlessly laid bare to give his name to it. Some skin-flint, who loved better the reflecting surface of a dollar or a bright scent in which he could see his own brazen face, who regarded even the wild ducks which settled in it as trespassers, his fingers grown into crooked and bony talons from the long habit of grasping harpy-like. So it is not named for me. I go not there to see him nor to hear of him, who never saw it, who never bathed in it, who never loved it, who never protected it, 
who never spoke a good word for it, nor thanked God that he had made it. Rather let it be named from the fishes that swim in it, the wild fowl or quadrupeds which frequent it, the wild flowers which grow by its shore, or some wild man or child the thread of whose history is interwoven with its own, not for him who could show no title to it but the deed which a like-minded neighbor or legislature gave him, him who thought only of its money value, whose presence perchance cursed all the shores, who exhausted the land around it, and would fain have exhausted the waters within it, who regretted only that it was not English hay or cranberry meadow. There was nothing to redeem it, forsooth, in his eyes, and would have drained and sold it for the mud at its bottom. It did not turn his mill, and it was no privilege to him to behold it. I respect not his labors. His farm, where everything has its price, who would carry the landscape, who would carry his god to market, if he could get anything for him, who goes to market for his god as it is, on whose farm nothing grows free, whose fields bear no crops, whose meadows no flowers, whose trees no fruits but dollars, who loves not the beauty of his fruits, whose fruits are not ripe for him till they are turned to dollars. Give me the poverty that enjoys true wealth. Farmers are respectable and interesting to me in proportion as they are poor, poor farmers. A model farm, where the house stands like a fungus in a muck-heap, chambers for men, horses, oxen, and swine, cleansed and uncleansed, all contiguous to one another, stocked with men, a great grease-spot, redolent of manures and buttermilk, under a high state of cultivation being manured with the hearts and brains of men, as if you were to raise your potatoes in the churchyard. Such is a model farm. No, no, if the fairest features of the landscape are to be named after men, let them be the noblest and worthiest men alone. Let our lakes receive as true names at least as the Icarian Sea, where, still the shore, a brave attempt resounds. Goose Pond, of small extent, is on my way to Flint's. Fair Haven, an expense of Concord River, said to contain some seventy acres, is a mile southwest, and White Pond, of about forty acres, is a mile and a half beyond Fair Haven. This is my lake country. These, with Concord River, are my water privileges, and night and day, year in, year out, they grind such grist as I carry to them. Since the woodcutters and the railroad, I myself have profaned Walden, perhaps the most attractive, if not the most beautiful, of all our lakes, the gem of the woods, is White Pond, poor name for its commonness, whether derived from the remarkable purity of its waters or the color of its sands. In these, as in other respects, however, it is a lesser twin of Walden. They are so much alike that you would say they must be connected underground. It has the same stony shore, and its waters are of the same hue. As at Walden, in sultry dog-day weather, looking down through the woods on some of its bays, which are not so deep, but that the reflection from the bottom tinges them, its waters are of a misty bluish-green or glaucous color. 
Many years since I used to go there to collect the sand by cartloads to make sandpaper with, and I have continued to visit it ever since. One who frequents it proposes to call it Virid Lake. Perhaps it might be called Yellow Pine Lake from the following circumstance. About fifteen years ago you could see the top of a pitch pine of the kind called yellow pine hereabouts, though it is not a distinct species, projecting above the surface in deep water many rods from the shore. It was even supposed by some that the pond had sunk, and this was one of the primitive forest that formerly stood there. I find that even so long ago as 1792, in a topographical description of the town of Concord, by one of its citizens, in the collections of the Massachusetts Historical Society, the author, after speaking of Walden and White Ponds, adds, In the middle of the latter may be seen, when the water is very low, a tree, which appears as if it grew in the place where it now stands. Although the roots are fifty feet below the surface of the water, the top of this tree is broken off, and at the place measures fourteen inches in diameter. In the spring of forty-nine I talked with the man who lives nearest the pond in Sudbury, who told me that it was he who got out this tree ten or fifteen years before. As near as he could remember it stood twelve or fifteen rods from the shore where the water was thirty or forty feet deep. It was in the winter, and he had been getting out ice in the forenoon, and had resolved that in the afternoon, with the aid of his neighbors, he would take out the old yellow pine. He sawed a channel in the ice toward the shore, and hauled it over and along and out onto the ice with oxen. But before he had gone far in his work he was surprised to find that it was wrong end upward, with the stumps of the branches pointing down, and the small end firmly fastened in the sandy bottom. It was about a foot in diameter at the big end, and he had expected to get a good saw log, but it was so rotten as to be fit only for fuel, if for that. He had some of it in his shed then. There were marks of an axe and of woodpeckers on the butt. He thought that it might have been a dead tree on the shore, but was finally blown over into the pond, and after the top had been waterlogged, while the butt-end was still dry and light, had drifted out and sunk, wrong end up. His father, eighty years old, could not remember when it was not there. Several pretty large logs may still be seen lying on the bottom, where, owing to the undulation of the surface, they look like huge water-snakes in motion. This pond has rarely been profaned by a boat, for there is little in it to tempt a fisherman. Instead of the white lily which requires mud, or the common sweet flag, the blue flag, iris versicolor, grows thinly in the pure water, rising from the stony bottom all around the shore, where it is visited by hummingbirds in June and the color both of its bluish blades and its flowers, and especially their reflections, is in singular harmony with the glaucous water. White Pond and Walden are great crystals on the surface of the earth, lakes of light. If they were permanently congealed and small enough to be clutched, they would perchance be carried off by slaves like precious stones to adorn the heads of emperors. But being liquid and ample, and secured to us and our successors for ever, we disregard them, and run after the diamond of Kohanor. They are too pure to have a market value. They contain no muck. How much more beautiful than our lives! How much more transparent than our characters are they? We never learned meanness of them. How much fairer than the pool before the farmer's door 
in which his ducks swim. Hither the clean wild ducks come. Nature has no human inhabitant who appreciates her. The birds with their plumage and their notes are in harmony with the flowers. But what youth or maiden conspires with the wild, luxuriant beauty of nature? She flourishes most alone, far from the towns where they reside. Talk of heaven, ye disgrace earth. End of chapter 9This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Chapter 10 Baker Farm. Sometimes I rambled to pine groves, standing like temples or like fleets at sea, full-rigged with wavy boughs and rippling with light, so soft and green and shady that the druids would have forsaken their oaks to worship in them, or to the cedar wood beyond Flint's Pond, where the trees, covered with hoary blue berries, spiring higher and higher, are fit to stand before Valhalla, and the creeping juniper covers the ground with wreaths full of fruit. Or to swamps, where the usnea lichen hangs in festoons from the white spruce trees, and toadstools, round tables of the swamp gods, cover the ground, and more beautiful fungi adorn the stumps, like butterflies or shells, vegetable winkles, where the swamp pink and dogwood grow, the red alderberry glows like eyes of imps, the waxwork grooves and crushes the hardest woods in its folds, and the wild hollyberries make the beholder forget his home with their beauty and he is dazzled and tempted by nameless other wild, forbidden fruits, too fair for mortal taste. Instead of calling on some scholar, I paid many a visit to particular trees, of kinds which are rare in this neighborhood, standing far away in the middle of some pasture, or in the depths of a wood or swamp, or on a hilltop, such as the black birch, of which we have some handsome specimens two feet in diameter, its cousin the yellow birch, with its loose golden vest, perfumed like the first, the beech, which has so neat a bowl and beautifully lichen-painted perfect in all its details, of which, excepting scattered specimens, I know but one small grove of sizable trees left in the township, supposed by some to have been planted by the pigeons that were once baited with beech-nuts nearby. It is worth the while to see the silver grain sparkle when you split this wood. The bass, the hornbeam, the Celtis occidentalis, or false elm, of which we have but one well grown, some taller mast of a pine, a shingle tree, or a more perfect hemlock than usual, standing like a pagoda in the midst of the woods, 
and many others I could mention. These were the shrines I visited, both summer and winter. Once it chanced that I stood in the very abutment of a rainbow's arch, which filled the lower stratum of the atmosphere, tinging the grass and leaves around, and dazzling me as if I looked through colored crystal. It was a lake of rainbow light, in which, for a short while, I lived like a dolphin. If it had lasted longer, it might have tinged my employments and life. As I walked on the railroad causeway, I used to wonder at the halo of light around my shadow, and would fain fancy myself one of the elect. One who visited me declared that the shadows of some Irishman before him had no halo about them, that it was only natives that were so distinguished. Benvenuto Cellini tells us in his memoirs that, after a certain terrible dream or vision which he had during his confinement in the castle of St. Angelo, a resplendent light appeared over the shadow of his head at morning and evening, whether he was in Italy or France, and it was particularly conspicuous when the grass was moist with dew. This was probably the same phenomenon to which I have referred, which is especially observed in the morning, but also at other times and even by moonlight. Though a constant one, it is not commonly noticed, and in the case of an excitable imagination like Cellini's, it would be basis enough for superstition. Beside, he tells us that he showed it to very few. But are they not indeed distinguished, who are conscious that they are regarded at all? I set out one afternoon to go a-fishing to Fair Haven, through the woods, to eke out my scanty fare of vegetables. My way led through Pleasant Meadow, an adjunct of the Baker Farm, that retreat of which a poet has since sung beginning, Thy entry is a pleasant field, which some mossy fruit trees yield, partly to a ruddy brook, by gliding musquash undertook, and mercurial trout darting about. I thought of living there before I went to Walden. I hooked the apples, leaped the brook, and scared the musquash and the trout. It was one of those afternoons which seem indefinitely long before one, in which many events may happen, a large portion of our natural life, though it was already half spent when I started. By the way there came up a shower, which compelled me to stand half an hour under a pine, piling boughs over my head and wearing my handkerchief for a shed and when at length I had made one cast over the pickerel weed, standing up to my middle in water, I found myself suddenly in the shadow of a cloud, and the thunder began to rumble with such emphasis that I could do no more than listen to it. The gods must be proud, thought I, with such forked flashes to rout a poor unarmed fisherman. So I made haste for shelter to the nearest hut, which stood half a mile from any road, but so much the nearer to the pond, and had long been uninhabited. And here a poet builded, in the completed years, for behold a trivial cabin that to destruction steers. So the muse fables. But therein, as I found, dwelt now John Field, an Irishman, and his wife, and several children, from the broad-faced boy who assisted his father at his work, and now came running by his side from the bog to escape the rain, to the wrinkled, sibyl-like, cone-headed infant that sat upon its father's knee as in the palaces of nobles, and looked out from its home in the midst of wet and hunger inquisitively upon the stranger. 
with the privilege of infancy, not knowing but it was the last of a noble line, and the hope and cynosure of the world, instead of John Field's poor starveling brat. There we sat together, under that part of the roof which leaked the least, while it showered and thundered without. I had sat there many times of old before the ship was built that floated his family to America. An honest, hard-working, but shiftless man plainly was John Field, and his wife, she too, was brave to cook so many successive dinners in the recesses of that lofty stove, with round greasy face and bare breast, still thinking to improve her condition one day, with the never-absent mop in one hand, and yet no effects of it visible anywhere. The chickens, which had also taken shelter here from the rain, stalked about the room like members of the family. Too humanized, methought, to roast well. They stood and looked in my eye or pecked at my shoe significantly. Meanwhile my host told me his story, how hard he worked bogging for a neighboring farmer, turning up a meadow with a spade or bog hoe at the rate of ten dollars an acre, and the use of the land with manure for one year, and his little broad-faced son worked cheerfully at his father's side the while, not knowing how poor a bargain the latter had made. I tried to help him with my experience, telling him that he was one of my nearest neighbors, and that I too, who came a-fishing here, and looked like a loafer, was getting my living like himself, that I lived in a tight, light, and clean house, which hardly cost more than the annual rent of such a ruin as his commonly amounts to, and how if he chose he might in a month or two build himself a palace of his own that I did not use tea, nor coffee, nor butter, nor milk, nor fresh meat, and so did not have to work to get them. Again, as I did not work hard, I did not have to eat hard, and it cost me but a trifle for my food. But as he began with tea, and coffee, and butter, and milk, and beef, he had to work hard to pay for them and when he had worked hard, he had to eat hard again to repair the waste of his system. And so it was as broad as it was long. Indeed it was broader than it was long, for he was discontented and wasted his life into the bargain. And yet he had rated it as a gain in coming to America, that here you could get tea and coffee and meat every day but the only true America is that country where you are at liberty to pursue such a mode of life as may enable you to do without these, and where the state does not endeavor to compel you to sustain the slavery and war and other superfluous expenses which directly or indirectly result from the use of such things for I purposely talked to him as if he were a philosopher, or desired to be one. I should be glad if all the meadows on the earth were left in a wild state, if that were the consequence of men's beginning to redeem themselves. A man will not need to study history to find out what is best for his own culture, but alas! The culture of an Irishman is an enterprise to be undertaken with a sort of moral bog-hoe. I told him that as he worked so hard at bogging he required thick boots and stout clothing, which yet were soon soiled and worn out, but I wore light shoes and thin clothing, which cost not half so much, though he might think that I was dressed like a gentleman which, however, was not the case. And in an hour or two, without labor, but as a recreation, I could, if I wished, 
catch as many fish as I should want for two days, or earn enough money to support me a week. If he and his family would live simply, they might all go a huckleberrying in the summer for their amusement. John heaved a sigh at this, and his wife stared with arms akimbo, and both appeared to be wondering if they had capital enough to begin such a course with, or arithmetic enough to carry it through. It was sailing by dead reckoning to them, and they saw not clearly how to make their port so. Therefore, I suppose, they still take life bravely, after their fashion, face to face, giving it tooth and nail, not having skill to split its massive columns with any fine entering wedge, and rout it in detail, thinking to deal with it roughly, as one should handle a thistle but they fight at an overwhelming disadvantage. Living, John Field, alas, without arithmetic, and failing so. Do you ever fish? I asked. Oh, yes, I catch a mess now, and then when I'm lying by, a good perch I catch. What's your bait? I catch shiners with fishworms, and bait the perch with them. "'You'd better go now, John,' said his wife, with glistening and hopeful face. But John demurred. The shower was now over, and a rainbow above the eastern woods promised a fair evening, so I took my departure. When I had got without I asked for a drink, hoping to get a sight of the well-bottom to complete my survey of the premises. But there, alas, are shallows and quicksands, and rope broken withal, and bucket irrecoverable. Meanwhile the right culinary vessel was selected, water was seemingly distilled, and after consultation and long delay passed out to the thirsty one. Not yet suffered to cool, not yet to settle. Such gruel sustains life here, I thought, so shutting my eyes, and excluding the motes by a skillfully directed undercurrent, I drank to genuine hospitality the heartiest draught I could. I am not squeamish in such cases when manners are concerned. As I was leaving the Irishman's roof after the rain, bending my steps again to the pond, my haste to catch pickerel, wading in retired meadows, in sloughs and bog-holes, in forlorn and savage places, appeared for an instant trivial to me who had been sent to school and college. But as I ran down the hill toward the reddening west, with the rainbow over my shoulder, and some faint tinkling sounds borne to my ear through the cleansed air, from I know not what quarter, my good genius seemed to say, Go fish and hunt, far and wide, day by day, farther and wider, and rest thee by many brooks and hearthsides without misgiving. Remember thy Creator in the days of thy youth. Rise free from care before the dawn, and seek adventures. Let the noon find thee by other lakes, and the night overtake thee everywhere at home. There are no larger fields than these, no worthier games than may here be played. Grow wild according to thy nature, like these sedges and brakes, which will never become English Bay. Let the thunder rumble. What if it threaten ruin to farmers' crops? That is not its errand to thee. Take shelter under the cloud, while they flee to carts and sheds. Let not to get a living be thy trade, but thy sport. 
enjoy the land, but own it not. Through want of enterprise and faith, men are where they are, buying and selling, and spending their lives like serfs. O oh, Baker Farm, landscape where the richest element is a little sunshine innocent. No one runs to revel on thy rail-fenced lee, debate with no man hast thou, with questions art never perplexed, as tame at the first sight as now, in thy plain russet gabardine dressed. Come ye who love, and ye who hate, children of the holy dove, and guy fowl of the state, and hang conspiracies from the tough rafters of the trees. Men come tamely home at night, only from the next field or street, where their household echoes haunt, and their life pines because it breathes its own breath over again. Their shadows morning and evening reach farther than their daily steps. We should come home from far, from adventures and perils and discoveries every day, with new experience and character. Before I had reached the pond, some fresh impulse had brought out John Field, with altered mind, letting go bogging ere this sunset. But he, poor man, disturbed only a couple of fins while I was catching a fair string, and he said it was his luck. But when we changed seats in the boat, luck changed seats too. Poor John Field. I trust he does not read this, unless he will improve by it, thinking to live by some derivative old country mode in this primitive new country, to catch perch with shiners. It is good bait, sometimes, I allow. With this horizon all his own, yet he a poor man, born to be poor, with his inherited Irish poverty, or poor life, his Adam's grandmother and boggy ways, not to rise in this world, he nor his posterity, till their wading webbed bog-trotting feet get Teleria to their heels. End of chapter 10